Okay, I'm going to call the order of the meeting. Je uh, Dr. Seuss is um, en route from a meeting she had in downtown Boston, so she'll be here shortly. As soon as she's here, the meeting will be in better hands. <laughs> <laughs> I want to welcome our AA rep, Juliana Keyes, is here tonight. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to start with public participation. The first person on the list is Pam Hallett. So just to understand the rules, you get three minutes. We can't respond, even if you throw something at us. <laughs> The way it goes. <laughs> so the rules. Am I close enough? Go ahead. Yeah, just say your name too. I'm please. Pam Hallett. I'm executive director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Thank you. I just want to ask that the board take a position in support of a sanctuary of the town becoming a sanctuary city. Uh, I also want to bring to your attention that currently the HUD budget is cutting all CDBG and home funds. So you might also want to take some position on that. That you want to see the CDBG left in the overall budget. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next, uh, Elizabeth Dre. There. Hi, good evening. I'm Elizabeth Dre. I'm here to represent the Arlington Teosinte Sister City Project, as well as Arlington Stands with Immigrants. And I'm here to ask the school committee to uh, have a statement go out to the school committee, to the school and their families, um, stating that Arlington is a safe welcoming environment for all students, regardless of their immigration status, as several of our uh, surrounding communities have already done. I think this is important uh, for us to affirm the rights, dignity, and contributions made by immigrant and refugee students and their families, to reassure all internationally born students that they will not be targeted, bullied, or discriminated against because of the color of their skin, as well as to reassure, reassure all of our students that their peers, classmates, and friends can focus on their learning while they're in our schools without fear of being targeted, detained, and separated from their families. And I'd also encourage you to take a statement on passing a safe schools resolution, as uh, Somerville has recently done. And I submitted um, language from letters from the superintendent of Cambridge, as well as Boston schools, to um, committee member uh, Dr. Seuss and, and uh, Mr. Schlickman, as well as the safe schools resolution that Somerville just passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I ask you to uh, give a copy of that uh, at some time to uh, the secretary so we can all see that? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Michael Ruderman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Thielman. Uh, good evening, members of the board. My name is Michael Ruderman. I'm pleased to be here tonight. I see on the agenda for tonight's meeting you have consideration of annual town meeting warrant article number 19. Article 19 is a proposal to study or, or other actions there too. Uh, the, the concept of having not an elected treasurer, but uh, an appointed treasurer for the town of Arlington. I'm here for myself. I'm also here for the one candidate who was on the ballot for, for that office in uh, April 1st's election, Dean Carmen, and I speak for him. Uh, for brevity, I'll go to the end of the story first. If you do not oppose Article 19 when it comes up at town meeting, and should it gain momentum, should it pass, the end of the story is that this committee will lose the authority over the chief financial officer of the Arlington Public School System. The article is filed not out of a general sense of good government or adherence to best practices. It is filed opportunistically. <clears throat> it was filed only on the day after our incumbent treasurer announced his resignation in that one or two day span in which there was no candidate running for the office, which then, of course, changed when, when there was a candidate who took out papers. It is an attempt by the Board of Selectmen, through the action of appointing their own treasurer for the town of Arlington, to consolidate the financial operations in this town, including the school department. If this article is not opposed, if the momentum builds up, and if in three years' time, which is, which is the shortest timetable, if in three years' time, 
we change our town's charter from, from electing a treasurer who has a policy component in his or her office to one who is appointed by the Board of Selectmen, you will see a consolidated finance in town with a chief officer who reports to the deputy or the assistant town manager, who reports to the town manager, who reports to the Board of Selectmen. This is the way it will unfold. And I ask for your, for your uh, consideration and resolution against favorable action on Article 19. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rudum, and thanks for being here. And then the next person, Deb Goldberg. Deb Goldsmith, sorry. <clears throat> Just made you treasurer of the Commonwealth. How's it going? <laughs> Good. She can give us some money. <clears throat> I'm Deborah Goldsmith. I live on at 21 Devereaux. I um, am here to speak in favor and strongly to support the movement towards Sanctuary City or whichever of the titles we might want to call it. But I am a member of the Democratic Town Committee, but more importantly for this purpose, I am a clinician in town. I'm a clinical social worker with a child and family practice in town, and it's from that base that I wish to speak because I have a number of children and parents in my caseload. The children in particular, some of them are terrified, not because they themselves are vulnerable, but because their friends and their relatives and extended family of their friends are vulnerable. And because they do see more of the news than some of us would wish that they would see, the trauma is profound. The sense of risk, the sense of vulnerability is not something we want for our children. It's not something that this town stands for. We work very hard in our schools, in our, you know, as parents in our neighborhoods to provide safe, secure environment. And this particular situation at the national level has shaken that very deeply. And I'm expecting that none of these children will ever forget what they're going through right now on the for the sake of their friends. And some of them themselves have relatives in, in Central or South America, for instance. Um, and feel very, very vulnerable about what they hear is happening at the border or what they hear that our president wants to do. So please consider the emotional impact on these families and on these children as deeply and as strongly and as compassionately as you're able. Thank you. So, actually, why don't Jeff, you <coughs> So, <clears throat> we did, we kind of reversed, we did public participation first. I didn't do the MOA on mm -hmm. kindergarten teachers. Okay. Because okay. I didn't. Okay. Uh, thank you. I apologize for being <laughs> late. So I'm why don't we do that then? Unexpected. Yeah. Um, well, should we uh, have a quick discussion? I came in late uh, about where we're sending this to. We talked about doing this at policy. Is that. Is that no? Okay, I, I came in late. Maybe I'm, I'm confused. No, so the, we're, not, we're not talking about public participation. No. We don't talk about public participation. We're sometimes no. talking about where we send things to. That's happened uh, okay. before. Um, I don't know. That's I was. Sure. I remember it, some, well, it came up at one point. Okay. Yeah. The two people came and talked about sanctuary cities. Okay. That was that's an article I think we're talking about later on. Oh, okay. The person talked about the elected treasurer. That's an article we're going on. Okay. And the Teosente group uh, was similar. To oh, sanctuary okay. cities, okay. to so they're, save kids. And right, so they're asking for a resolution from the school committee. Right. So that would go to policies. So I think I think what the question is, um, yeah, where where do we consider that resolution? With it's. I would I would suggest we wait till policy and then at that point it. direct. Okay, direct, that sounds good. Okay. Have a discussion at that point. Okay, that's that's all. That's all. Really comment there. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. And again, I apologize for being late. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the vote memorandum of agreement between the Arlington School Committee and the Arlington Education Association. Uh, this is something that we voted in um, executive committee and we now need to vote in public. Um, it's a non-contentious um, housekeeping type of thing. Um, do we have a motion? 
uh, move to uh, approve the MOA on kindergarten teachers for the 2017-2018 school year dated March 2nd, 2017. Great. Uh, Second. Seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Um, and we have to do a roll call vote for this. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, why? Do, why do we not? I don't think no. so. We don't? Okay. Yeah. You can choose the Okay, one. so let's not. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm still getting this. I will not. I'll You'll get, get it. it. You'll get it down just I'll get it the next last week. meeting. Two, two weeks from there. <laughs> okay, uh, so all those in favor of the memorandum agreement between the school committee and the Arlington Education Association, the MOA on kindergarten teachers, um, please signify by saying aye. 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 And that's unanimous. Yeah, explain yes, what the, the, yes, the MOA is, people listening. Yes. Uh, when we did the calendar in January, we, we, we offered a different scenario. And after more discussion with kindergarten teachers, it was um, agreed upon that we probably sh w would like to give next year one more um, opportunity with how we open the school year for kindergarten students this year. And what that means is that on the Tuesday after Labor Day, there will be an open house for parents at their children's, their child's school. Then on Wednesday, half, half the class will go <coughs> to school all day, and on Thursday, the other half the class will go to school all day. And on Friday, all students in the class will go to school together for the full day. Um, this gives an opportunity for the, the young, these young students to our school to have an opportunity to learn the routines uh, in a smaller group and uh, then have a chance at the end of the week to come together as a class. So we, we collectively felt that this was um, preferable to what was originally proposed and that's why there is an agreement uh, this evening. Great, if, thank you. Yes, Mr. Hainer. I, I know we've accepted it and this may be just clerical. The actual memorandum of agreement does not specify, it just says first day, second day as opposed to the day after Labor Day. I don't know whether that is an issue. Uh, it would be a clerical change only that... Uh... Mr. Spiegel? No, I don't think that was an issue. That was intentional, I think, to do it that way. Fine. It's, but it is, does mean the first day will be the Tuesday after Labor Day. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, we welcome Julianne Keyes, um, AEA rep, um, and to say that Cindy Starks uh, cannot make it tonight. Okay. Yes. Um, Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the approval of the Arlington High School trip, and this is a new trip, so we, we, we sort of uh, look at new trips first before we make our approval. Um, um, is Mr. Ed Foley. Ms. Ed Foley? Okay, great, thank you. Who is a Latin teacher here at the high school. Great. First of all, thank you for hearing my proposal. Um, so recently, Catherine Ritz, the director of World Languages here at the high school, was contacted indirectly by a school in Florence called the Istituto Marco Polo. And they were interested in doing a, an exchange homestay. So they would send some students here in September to stay with some families in Arlington. And then we would go in eight, during April vacation to spend the week with those same families. So having talked it over with uh, Tony DeSanzo, who teaches Italian here at the high school, and myself, uh, we decided to, that we would go ahead, provided we could um, garner enough interest and see if it would work out. So I'm just here to pitch this proposal to you all. Okay, great. Questions and comments, Mr. Hainer? I, I think it's a fantastic trip. Thank you very much for doing this. My only concern is in that piece, and I direct this more to the, the superintendent, talking about funds for students who have difficulty paying scholarships. It says no. Uh, I, I know we're tight and everything, but I, hopefully we can find something to help anybody that is interested in going. Yes, Th this year we've, been, we've set aside um, a small amount of money uh, for scholarships for our trips that we, we've developed a process by how students can apply. And that whole protocol is now in place. There's a few more tweaks, but my hope is that next year we can offer a little bit more. The funds for the scholarships comes from the international ac account, which is an appropriate, very appropriate use for it. And what we're trying to do is to encourage more international travel for our students. So we'll reevaluate how much money is possible to do next year, and um, 
that, that'll be available. Is there something available for this trip if somebody applies? Well, this trip is next year, so. Oh, this is, I oh, apologize. Right. I'm trip. sorry. So, yes. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. There is some money left for trips this year. I, I don't think it's fully been expended yet. <coughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Thank Allison Anthony. Um, oh, do, do don't leave yet. Do we know if this trip is one where you pay to the company or does the school take in the funds and then pay? We will pay directly to the company. Uh, it's a pro, the company is Pro May Tour, which is a company I know we've used in the past. The, the students will pay directly to the company? Um, that I'm actually not sure about. <coughs> I would have to ask Catherine Ritz about that, but I think the students would pay directly to the company. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Is um, for a student to go on this trip, would they have to necessarily open their home to another student, or what if they, their home what, you know, is too small or whatever? And could there be somebody else step in to house another, a student from the group? As far as I know, whoever is planning to go to Italy will have to host, host as well. the student. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage you, that might be hard for some kids, sure. and so um, maybe to informally, there might be another way to make an arrangement to somebody else can offer to host on, on a student's behalf if, if that were a problem. I think, yeah, I think that could be a possibility depending on how much interest uh, we get in the, in the idea. Good. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very it much. sounds like a great trip. Thank you. Who's going make the motion? Oh, we need a motion uh, to approve the tree by Mr. Cardin, Second. seconded by Mr. Hainer. All in favor, please say by aye. Aye. Aye, aye. aye. yes. Uh, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are on to budget stuff. Um, so I know that when we last met, we've, we've, we've sort of met and talked about budget issues uh, for several times, but uh, there were lingering questions. Uh, we, in mm -hmm. the interim, we've had a, a changeover of our CFO, and so that makes it harder to answer some of the questions. Um, I know that uh, Ms. Mertz is here today again with us mm -hmm. um, to potentially help us out. So how do we want to handle this? Do we want to, do you have questions that you know that, I mean, are there, are there things that we, you know we've given you already and we can start talking about yes. now? And then we'll, if there are additional lingering questions, we can open that as well. Yes, there were questions that we took notes about mm -hmm. last time, and um, Ms. Mertz is prepared to answer the questions, but certainly to the extent that we can, we're happy to see if we can answer other questions. I will preface this by saying it takes a lot of research because as you know how this budget is set up, it's set up through different lenses. And so it, it can take a, a lot of time to understand how numbers are regrouped re, uh, uh, in different sections of the budget. So I think, you know, we have uh, Ms. Merce's <coughs> time for one day a week, and so to the extent that we can do the questions as well as the other things that need to happen is, is the, the one of the, the constraints we have here. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you because I know you actually have the questions written down you want to answer, right? Well, I think I've answered a lot of them on this memo. I believe that maybe the budget subcommittee might have some. It, well, so maybe. It, um, if I may, I, I talked with her prior to the meeting. She, she had already answered the questions, most of the questions on the side, those that she hadn't answered at, when I got it back. She answered to me tonight to my satisfaction. Okay, I guess uh, there's a couple of questions. One is, are there lingering questions that the um, public would want answered now in public, or are there and then are there remaining questions that maybe are ti tiny technical details, maybe not as much interest to the public that we would like to answer to Let this me point. confess publicly, since you, you're pushing me on this, I misread a line, mm. and it was a total line and not the uh, line that I brought forward on transportation. Okay. And uh, okay. I, my colleague, Mr. Cardin, tried to explain that, and I wasn't paying attention to him, and I apologize to him publicly as well. Thanks to her, okay. she hit me on the head, and I got it clear this time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, that was the big one, it was $5 million. So that, the, the other one, uh, the my, my lingering one. transportation or? That no. we, I read it as vocational transportation. Mm, oh, and right. what it was was a total town allotment number. Mm, I read it. it in the wrong line. Got it. Okay. And the, uh, uh, the other question on teacher longevity uh, is, is very convoluted. Uh, it's still a negative for this year, but I, I believe going forward it will be a set figure and things will be yeah, worked out. Yeah, it sounds like we're, we're looking in the future yes. to budget 
accurate yes. numbers, <coughs> right, rather than guesstimates. Um, Dr. Alice Nampi. Um, so I had a set of questions that haven't been answered okay, yet. Great. Um, the most important one of those is in section six on page three of three, um, lines 6848 and 6851. So the, yeah. out of districts? Yeah, it's six. just what happened to the money there? If you look in FY18 level service versus FY17. So what I do know in terms of um, line 6851 of what we've actually spent um, for that line item in FY16 was 2.4 million. I think each of these different lines, I think in total, will add up to what we're spending for most of these line items, but <coughs> different sections of the book show different amounts everywhere, and I'm not sure why. But in total, when you add them all together, it gets us to the number that we, we need to get to in terms of those two out-of-district line items. OK, so we don't know why the number in, in um, line 6848 is 5 million, 5.8 million. No, so I know at the run rate as of right now, or at least for FY16 and what was reported in the end of year report, was actually 3.8 or 3.6 million, not 5.8. But together, I think it'll guess, get us to the amount that we need to be at for out of district. I believe our run rate right now is like the $8 million range right now, which includes the circuit breaker piece. Okay, so we don't understand why those numbers were, why I mean, they why were, the no. money is moved around. No, because I think there's okay. another question that you had on a different section that only shows like 53,000. So again, yeah, don't know why. But I do know what okay. we've actually spent for yeah. that line item. Last year was 2.4, and then um, for the, the separate day, both private and public was, I believe, 1.8 million at each each side, so about okay. 3.6. So big picture, what you're saying <coughs> is that we've got the right amount between the two accounts in district. I, believe so. I mean, the day place, day residential, and the out of district. Um, <laughs> separate day, there's right? private day, uh, separate day, day and residential. And I residential, all yes. Together yes, all together gets us to, that about gets us to the right number, number, and we don't know why the numbers got fudged around. Okay. Um, okay, I was hoping we would get some clarity on that, but I understand that it wasn't you that did it and mm -hmm. that it's just not clear. Um, that was the biggest one of my. Sure. Questions. Um, looking at the other ones, I'm not. Um, I don't think any of them are worth bringing up at this point. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, are there any that you think are big picture that you know the, that you feel like you could give the answer to now? Or are they all just smaller points? They're probably just smaller, smaller points. points. Not <laughs> really small okay. Um, yeah, Dr. Brady. But there is an important one here, um, and that is the average uh, special education growth over the past five years. And actually, um, our, our new accountant has put together a chart, which um, I, I will certainly forward to you. I was looking at it today and making a, some reviewing the numbers. And, uh, and this is actually something that this, the Finance Committee would like, too. So it's a chart that shows what our actual expenses were in a given year, what our budgeted number was, what's the difference, and what's the percent increase. When you average, I think it's the last six years, and of course this year is still not complete, but um, the average increases was over 7%. It's quite variable. This year's increase is over 14%. And then you have, num you have a year where it's under 1%. So that's the volatility of this. Um, any remaining questions for the school committee? That <coughs> I said, if, if it feels like we're spinning around, we, because we've, we've actually been talking about the budget for, for a bunch of meetings at this point. So 
Um, okay, well, thank I'm, you very much. Yes, Dr. Elson. So I'm, I'm a little confused by the agenda. Let me get back to it because we have budget questions here and then there's budget discussion, discussion. and budget approval. So I don't know where to put <laughs> some of these things. Yeah, no, I, I know. I think that's, I think the budget discussion, I mean, this is, um, actually, I didn't create this exactly, but it, it worked from, you know, I didn't, I didn't change it. Um, uh, the superintendent is giving, going to give her recommendation um, for that 300,000, and I think then we need to have a discussion about that recommendation, and that's going to come afterwards. I mean, that's how okay. I see it. So we're not happening. talking about that stuff. We're not talking about that yet. Okay. But um, does that seem right? That, that's that's right. The, it was the the organization of this really had to do with the availability of people, and um, okay. we offered to have Ms. Mertz early in the agenda so she would not be here all evening. Right. Okay. Because th those questions are not right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for thank you. Thank your time here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we get um, to hear, I mean, this is one of the things I think is really valuable at school committee meetings is to hear what's happening in our schools from the curriculum directors um, because I think, you know, I talk to parents a lot and parents often have a sense that schools are the same as when they were going to school, right? They don't really sort of get a sense of how much has changed and how much is going on. So it's really exciting that we can just point to them and say, look, there was this excellent presentation on all the fabulous things we're doing in English and history and math and whatever, right? So, so, so thank you for coming in and we're looking forward to this. So next is um, Ms. Perry, um, come up and introduce yourself. <coughs> And so um, there's this microphone that you have to talk into, Sorry. so just to get to public, you know, <laughs> right. out there. So, if, so you can move it around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is our, our director yes. of um, English Language Arts, uh, K-12, and she has brought with her one of her esteemed high school English teachers, <laughs> Justin Barraza. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't ever think about showing things because we do words, we don't do so. <laughs> so so we, we may have something for you to see in a minute. Um, so uh, w the thing that I really wanted to talk about initially was, um, was words um, and the importance of words and how the whole idea of words and what they mean are part of what we do in English classes from um, the elementary through the high school. But it be has become such a loaded <laughs> political topic that I decided to shift a little bit um, to do to sort of think about what really goes on in English classes. What's the what's the big sort of common um, sort of process that we that we carry out in any English class? And I came upon the idea of patterning. Uh, I was talking with Matt Coleman about this, and patterning is a huge element of math instruction as well, and we could maybe say that about any, um, any subject because learning is actually about putting things in patterns and seeing how they work. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting for you maybe to hear a little bit about how patterning is something um, that we use and that we help kids to see um, as we go through um, the various things that we do in English classes. So um, I'm going to start with the idea of um, literal transference. Now, most of the stuff that we do in English classes, um, we don't expect to see ideas that we talk about literally trans, you know, transferred to people's lives. We, we usually deal with ideas that occur in different ways. But recently, um, we had an interesting example at Audison where um, the students were reading in the seventh grade, um, Warriors Don't Cry. It's a book about um, the uh, Little Rock Nine. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it details the struggles of these kids who tried to, who didn't try, but they were in the schools and not wanted, and it was really difficult. Um, and at the end of that book, um, Rachel Grodman, a seventh grade teacher, got a letter from a parent um, saying that her daughter was not gonna be in school for a few days. And the reason was that the family was going to go to Washington, to the March on Washington in January. Um, and, and she cited the book as the impetus for the family deciding to do it, sort of acting on your principles, standing up for yourself, doing what's important. So um, that was an interesting and not very common 
experience to have something that is, was read in class actually have um, uh, an observable um, result in somebody's life. So it's great for the teacher to know. And it was also, um, it's one example of how the patterning that, that you saw people's lives, and this is a nonfiction book, um, that patterning sort of projected into, um, into actual daily life of our students. So that's, that's one place, but as I said, it's not necessarily the most common, nor is it what, what we're really moving towards. Um, the second area where patterning is really big um, is in the whole issue of meaning in literature, just meaning in general. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, in Romeo and Juliet, which is a book most of you probably sort of came upon at some point in your life. I know when I came upon it, I couldn't believe that, um, I, I was so anxious to read this book or this play when I was a kid and I, want, I was wanted it to be a love story. So <laughs> you get into the, the first, the whole first act. I mean, it's like people fighting and you know, it's a terrible, terrible story. I was, you know, boys fighting. I was not interested in this book um, or in this play. It just it irritated me. Um, and in fact, what goes on in the whole, in the whole process of this particular piece of literature is we have wars and we have wars between people. We have um, destruction. We have nastiness, which is the entire environment. And then in the middle of this, we have two kids who are falling in love. And so what we have is the pattern of how people behave badly. And then what happens when you try to get that germ of love in the middle of that and how one pattern affects the other. So, you know, without the whole war issue, the tragedy of the love wouldn't, couldn't have happened the way it did. So frequently in the literature that we read, we have one set of patterns, one set of ideas, one set of behaviors, which create a kind of universe, and then another set which create another universe. And it's the interplay or the juxtaposition of those two patterns where meaning sort of evolves. So, you know, that's one example. Another example from a book that you guys um, probably remember from some point in your life is from uh, Mockingbird. Um, and the thing about the, the patterns in that book are interesting because you've got um, little kids showing all the innocence of being little kids and you have a number of characters who show innocence and how lovely it is to be innocent. And if you read that book, um, often, at least for me, I can remember back to the innocence of just playing around and doing silly things that kids do. That contrasts with the whole issue of ignorance. And a number of the questions that come up here are questions of, you know, if you are innocent, can you be ignorant? What is ignorance? How do those two go together? Is ignorance really lack of learning? Or how do those ideas play? So the <coughs> patterning that you see, the, the constant set of examples of, of innocence play against an increasing set of examples of ignorance and bias and prejudice and, and um, bad behavior in all sorts of ways. And so each of the, e neither of those sides without the other would, would make a lot of sense or wouldn't make as much sense. So you need both. So we, so we ask kids, we help kids to see how the behaviors and the patterns of behaviors um, actually work to reinforce each other and to make meaning. And then the transferring of that, I think, to the way people think is that there's the idea that kids begin to look for patterns. They begin to look to see how things fall into line and how things sort of um, make sense in a, in a kind of order and what that order is and how that order could shift. So, I mean, we could go through every book that we teach, but I won't do that to you. Um, so, um, the third area where patterning well, we spend a lot of time on the issue of patterning is around structure. And in literature, structure um, is, you know, often structure is, is part of the meaning. Certainly the best example of that is poetry. In a sonnet, the sonnet makes part of the meaning. In a haiku, um, the same thing occurs. In a play, you have a certain number of acts, and the acts begin to shape what goes on. You can only do so much, I and mean, plays can't be that long, so whatever happens has to happen there. So you begin, so we begin to talk to kids about how when you are reading something, the shape of that thing adds meaning. That begins to move into the area of writing. So when you're writing something, the shape that you put it in, how it's formed, that, um, 
that begins to make meaning as well. So kids begin to be conscious of how something goes together and the way that it goes together is the way that meaning occurs from it. Um, in novels, in short stories, the same thing. We have lots of words um, that you're familiar with. Plot, the main issue of structure, but then there's themes within that. There's subplots. Um, there's um, all sorts of imaging, all the literary terms that you know. All those things begin to make patterns, which make meaning. Um, the final example has to do with, um, with sentences. And um, in, I wanted to read to you um, the first sentence from a book by Toni Morrison, which um, the seniors in the AP class read. And um, it, the, the book is Song of Solomon, and Song of Solomon is an incredible book. It's, a, it's not an easy book to read, um, but it's, it keeps giving um, incredible imagery and ideas and it just keeps coming back at you. It's not a book you can passively read, but it's a book that every time you put some energy into it, you get a whole bunch more back. Um, so I'm going to read you the first sentence, which is a goofy sentence. And the whole first scene of the, of the book is just <laughs> and there's a show. Off to the goofy. side are people standing on chairs. Um, <laughs> Conklin is standing on a chair. Um, I, I don't need the thing anymore, guys. <laughs> you don't need to do this. Um, but the whole first scene of this, of this book is, is it's a crazy scene. Um, but the first, the first sentence is this. You have it, I think I put it in your notes. Um, the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance agent promised to fly from Mercy to the other side of Lake Superior at 3 o'clock. Now, that sentence in and of itself um, may or may not make a lot of sense. When I started this book, I was petrified because I was going to have to teach it. I hadn't read it before, and I, th and I thought, oh my, I don't know what this is going to be. And I read the sentence, and I was it completely um, demonstrated why I needed to be nervous. Um, so um, when I did it with kids, we read it out loud a few times, and we tried to figure out what these words could mean. None of these words is, is difficult. They're all pretty straightforward <laughs> words. Um, but Toni Morrison actually talks about this, as in, and um, I want to just read to you how she talks about putting sentences together, and that's why this is, that's why um, I've sort of included this. She spends a lot of time talking about um, sentences and how she writes them. Um, so I'm going to read the sentence again and then what she says about her construction of it. The North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance agent promised to fly from Mercy to the other side of Lake Superior at 3 o'clock. This declarative sentence is designed to mock a journalistic style with a minor alteration. It could be the opening of an item in a small town newspaper. It has the tone of an everyday event of minimal local interest, yet I wanted it to contain important signs and crucial information. The name of the insurance company is that of a well-known black-owned company dependent on black clients, and in its corporate name are Life and Mutual. The sentence starts with North Carolina and closes with Lake Superior. Geographical locations that suggest a journey from north, excuse me, from south to north, a direction common for black immigration and in the literature about it, but which is reversed here since the protagonist has to fly south to mature. Two other words of significance are fly and mercy. Both terms are central to the narrative. Flight as escape or confrontation. Mercy, the unspoken wish of the novel's population. Some grant it, some despise it. One makes it the sole cry of her extemporaneous sermon upon the death of her granddaughter. And she goes on. I thought it was good for you to hear this because the precision that, that um, Morrison describes here in her choice of words in this one sentence is the kind of precision that we would hope we could lead students to understand that sentences need to have or that conversation needs to have. Um, we're in a time right now, and it's making English teaching interesting, where precision in language isn't necessarily something that's as valued or it's valued differently than, it, than I remember it being or that I would like to think it is. Um, so this takes on, for me, a fairly, um, a, a fairly heavy meaning because um, if, if it's the only thing that we do to help kids understand that the words that they use represent the ideas in their heads 
and the ideas in the heads are what they are, you know, that we are all of, that the things that we say and the things that we write are us. It's the only way we get it out of here is to get it out somehow on paper or in words. And, and being true to that is really key and important. So I thought that would be something interesting for you to know about. In a minute, I'm gonna let Justin talk about the new um, 10th grade course, but I just wanna read you one more thing from Toni Morrison's Nobel um, Prize um, uh, acceptance speech. Um, she writes about words. Word work is sublime because it's generative. It makes meaning that secures our difference our human difference, the way in which we are like no other life. We die, that may be the meaning of life, but we do language, that may be the measure of, of, our, the measure of our lives. And I think that's really cool because the language is the me what we say, what we think is the measure of our lives. So from that to Justin, go. Thank you. <laughs> um, to kind of just follow up on, on what Ms. Perry was saying, um, first of all, thank you for having me and entertaining this. <laughs> um, it's the, the, the new course is actually a product of studying patterns um, in, in the classroom um, and, and in the ELA classroom. And, and we are, we're always asking our students, you know, what are you noticing? What are the things that you're noticing? Um, and, and the 10th graders especially are really, really focusing on the, the things that they observe and the patterns that they do notice. and to. Uh, quote Ian Fleming um, in Goldfinger, the, the original quote is once is an event, twice is a coincidence, and three times is enemy action. We modify <laughs> that obviously because we're not dealing with enemy action necessarily, but we are in the business of patterns all the time. Um, and so, you know, that's where many of the 10th grade uh, English teachers are starting, right? As opposed to these big questions about what, you know, what's the theme of Macbeth? Which one? There are so many of them. We're asking the students to discover what the patterns are so that they can make their own meaning with these classical texts. And that is where they start. They're engaging you know, halfway between this very formal literary lens and this reader response lens of what's exciting you know, to, to these students. You've got your, your language and structural patterns that, like, like Ms. Perry mentioned, but you also have the tendency to you know, literally stab your best friends in the back in Macbeth. These are the patterns, you know, there's something for everyone. <laughs> um, and, and so it's, it's moving on these patterns and, and you know, we're, we're calling this new course Examining Expression because the old course was called Literary Heritage. Um, and, and midway through the year, um, as part of MCAS preparation, but also just as, as, the part, as a part of the, the normal preparation in the, the, the course, um, over the 10th grade year, we asked the students, okay, so what are you noticing about all of these texts? Um, and recently a student said something along the lines of, everything is about war and life is horrible. Um, <laughs> which, it was, it was hard to argue with that a little bit. Um, and, and to the point that was raised earlier, you know, some of these texts, which are fabulous, really, really rich texts that are very, very dense and so nuanced and, and are considered canonical or classical works of literature, some of them were written hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do was move away from this idea of this, you know, or, or expand upon the idea of this is your literary heritage. You're all doomed basically to, you know, uh, not figure out how to communicate effectively and everyone in your family will <coughs> perish as a result of your inability to communicate um, and, and kind of open things up a little bit. Um, so we're, we're hoping to turn the corner and, and really expand and challenge the students to um, expand their own experience as they identify these patterns into something, you know, where they're looking at all four modes of communication that are stressed by the common core, for example, but are really, really important in everyday life with reading, writing, speaking, and listening. If most of these characters that they've dealt with already were a little bit better at listening or a little bit better at speaking, everything would have been, I'm not gonna say great, much better though. Um, and the students are recognizing this. And so that being said, we're hoping, we're, we're hoping to, to create an opportunity to change things up and, and start adding things 
to the 10th grade curriculum that will encourage students to see a little bit more of themselves in the authors, in the, the characters, in the protagonists, um, so that we're not reading things necessarily, again, these wonderful works of literature that are primarily, if not in the 10th grade, mostly all by deceased white men. Um, so we're, we're moving towards this, this place where a student um, who does not identify as white can see themselves in the characters, in the authors, while still understanding the patterns that are happening um, through, you know, what does effective communication look like? And so by even calling the course Examining Expression, we feel really, really positive about the idea that they'll be able to, you know, they'll, they'll be expected to, but also be encouraged to and, and develop the skills to figure out oh, this is what happens when I don't talk about my feelings appropriately. This is what happens when I don't listen to someone who's really trying to give me, if not good advice, some advice or some, you know, someone cares about me. In addition to those skills about reading and writing that we're already working on in terms of, again, looking at those patterns. Um, one of, one of uh, my coworkers, Tim Martin, um, I, I distinctly remember in his interview, not exactly what he said, but he mentioned that literature is how we get to examine, something along the lines of literature is how we get to examine the more difficult experiences and decisions and ideas in a safe manner, which is to say, we don't have to deal with the real life ramifications of these things that all of these characters are experiencing but most of the characters in the 10th grade curriculum are choosing the worst possible thing you could do as a result. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that, you know, in this fast paced world, in this, you know, I won't say shoot first, but in this tweet first, ask questions later environment <laughs> that the world really, really embraces now, whether or not we like it, we can still stay rooted in the text, in the literature. No matter what that text looks like, we can look at those patterns and, and see, okay, it doesn't matter who's doing it. What, what is being said? What is, is being claimed? What, what's the claim here? And we can identify those patterns using the tools and the skills that will allow us to um, hopefully be less judgmental and communicate way more effectively than um, we currently do just kind of as a, a society um, and, and as a world. Um, so we're hoping to, as I said, expand and open up um, and, and even maybe this year start piloting um, uh, at least one new text or a couple of new texts by the end of the year that will offer students um, who maybe have not seen themselves in literature the chance to do that um, in a way that um, they'll be able to, to really, again, use all four of those communication modes to demonstrate both that they are very skilled and talented in, in the things that they are reading, um, but also that what they're reading does matter um, in, in the, the, the real world, which as Deb mentioned, sometimes it doesn't feel like that. We, 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 we feel confident that we can help the students understand you know, obviously, I keep going back to Macbeth because I think it's the stabbiest of all of the, uh, <laughs> the, the texts that we work with, but a lot of them do, in fact, focus on war and, and things like that, which hopefully is not the message um, that, that we want the students to, to receive over the course of the 10th grade curriculum. <laughs> so Thanks. thank you for listening. Thanks. So I stay there. We're going to have questions and comments. Mr. Hainer. I have a question and a comment. When, they do, when you do Shakespeare with them, do you read it in the, uh, the, original, the Middle English? So we, it adapted? we access, I mean, we use Shakespeare's original texts, um, and, and at least in my classes, I'm sure in all of the other 10th grade classes, we read what's on the page. Um, we do have access to uh, modern adaptations, and there are things like No Fear Shakespeare right. and things like that that help them. My comment is that uh, my 10th grade teacher turned me on by letting, making us read, or read with her from the book orally. Then yeah. she brought in, and I'm going to date myself, records <laughs> from professional actors. I remember Dame Judith Anderson playing Lady Macbeth. And hearing it and seeing it, double modality, uh, uh, you could get it right. We got it right away. And then she would ask us to turn around. Basically, she would, it must have been a woman way before her time, to what's going on in the world right now that is similar. <clears throat> sure. And, and <clears throat> convert I mean, I... The idea of Shakespeare was so alien to me. After having this teacher, we were all turned on to it and excited about it. And uh, I, th I thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Our kids today. Um, so I have a general question and comment. A question: um, How do you see English language arts having? How has it changed in the last ten years? And where do you see it going in the next five years? English instruction. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In five words or less. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's put notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, one, of the, one of the interesting thing that's, things that's happened, which is not news to anybody, is that kids, you used to be able to go to the store and you could sort of quietly buy that little book that was the synopsis of, of whatever it was you were supposed to be reading. Now it's so much easier. You just go click, click, and it's online. <laughs> Um, so we've had to be a little bit creative about ways that we, um, we have to own the fact that that's there. I mean, we, you know, no, no sort of threats, no, <laughs> nothing's going <laughs> to stop that from happening. So where it becomes, um, where we really notice a change is in kids can get, um, in addition to sort of information about whatever the book is about, but also papers written on any topic that we could come up with. So we've, we've changed the way we do our writing assignments in, in general. And this actually is, coincides nicely with what, with what um, the SAT is doing and with what the MCAS is doing and what PARC is doing. Where, and it's actually much better educationally. We're asking kids to look at a couple of different pieces of text that, that could, be, could be music, and a poem, it could be a, you know, a poem and a piece of, uh, piece of uh, like a short story. It could be any number of things, nonfiction, fiction. And then ask them, and maybe they're on similar topics or, or somewhat similar topics. Ask them to read that. Come up with some places, patterning again, where there's commonality and then come with their own idea about what that might be and then go back to the text and find the evidence. It's the same process that we ask them to do. It's actually much more creative, much more interesting, um, and it's a little more foolproof in terms of kids not being able to find that thing mm. or, or you know, that question online and just <coughs> copying it. Um, so that's one thing. I think um, my own, and you, uh, you can talk in one sure. second. Yeah. Um, there's this other, other thing that's happening to me, and I, there could be lots of other reasons for that, but I think it's happening to, to kids also, where attention spans are shorter because of um, technology and people get, can get things so much more quickly and sort of access it and then get, you know, get the, the real synopsis and then get in and get out. And so sustaining, helping kids to figure out how to sustain focus on a piece of literature, for instance, or sustain focus on a piece of writing so that it's not just done I mean this is this is an, an age old issue for English teachers that you, you know you give them two weeks and they still do it the last night so you know, that <laughs> I never did that issue of <laughs> how to sort of reinforce that um, but paying attention paying close attention isn't isn't the same given as it used to be and I'm not sure whatever was a total given but it's not as easy uh, and I, I think to kind of expand on that, we're in, we're in a place now, and, and we will continue moving forward into this place where e anything and everything can be a text. Evaluating yes. which things should be considered, you know, evaluating sources, um, whether it's Wikipedia or the sources at the bottom of Wikipedia, which is, I feel like I have this conversation every week with my students. You know, there are different ways to obtain sources. Don't take the easy way out, whether it is looking at, at a Twitter feed or you know a peer-reviewed journal, figuring out the the best way to evaluate or how to evaluate a text for for what it's best for or what the author does best or what the argument does best is really really important and becoming increasingly important when there's just so much out there. Um, and and on the flip side of that, the the creative piece, you know, we strive to to have students um, create something that w makes makes them proud to demonstrate that they learned something as opposed to just just spitting something back out. You know, um, and, and I, I know most of, I, I believe the 10th grade, yeah, the 10th grade, um, you know, we, we have a final writing piece, but we also have this creative piece where we ask them to work with characters across different texts. What would that look like? What would it look like if, I think one of the examples last year was if SpongeBob SquarePants were the, the, the cast of Macbeth? How would this work? And it's to totally bizarre, but sometimes the tiniest, littlest things demonstrate the deepest nuances. Demonstrate, you know, it's it's totally silly. I couldn't I couldn't name a character other than SpongeBob SquarePants, but when the students come in and and are talking about no, actually, you know, I made this character do this because if you look at this, you know, Act Two, Scene Three. This, you know, this is something that's really important to this character, and now all of a sudden, these connections between seemingly unrelated texts 
are, are really making sense to students. That's the sort of thing that, that kind of really um, excites me. Um, and and we, can, we can get them to this place of understanding, you know, know your audience. Hopefully you're not necessarily going to, you know, here I am at a school committee meeting talking about SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> um, but hopefully you're, you're not going to be, you know, defending your doctorate talking about SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, but instead, you know, the, the difference between, you know, thine, thy, thou, thee in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet or something like that. But knowing your audience and understanding that, you can really get creative and demonstrate your, your really nuanced understanding of a, a complex text with a Twitter feed, with a, you know, a fake Twitter feed, something that you just create on paper or you know, using the Chromebooks. It's a whole spectrum of knowing when and how, not to strike exactly, but how to, to be surgical in your interpretation, but also your creation to demonstrate, I've got it. It doesn't just have to be the answer this question you've got you know, in, in three, three pages or more. It can be, it can take many shapes. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Allison Um When you talk about them writing the evidence-based analytical essays, where do they learn how to write that? Are they supposed to learn that before, or is it in, you know, is it in that class they learn and then also produce, or? It's a constant. Um, mm. uh, it, starts, it starts a little bit in the elementary. Some of the Lucy Calkins units are about that. So we're, what we're constantly doing <laughs> or asking kids to do is come up with an idea and then how, why, do, why do you have that idea? What's the evidence for that idea? So it's a claim, I mean essentially it's a claim and an evidence. So um, it's the idea of making it in a form of an essay gets more sophisticated as kids get older, but the process of, of asking kids to sort of look at something or think about something and then have an idea and generate an idea and then figure out why they had that idea. That process is a constant. Um, the, it's, the whole question of writing, I, I know we don't, we, I'm using up all the time of the night, we need, but um, the whole issue of writing a formal essay it has come under a lot of um, criticism because the, the simplest way to teach essay writing is to say, is the five paragraph essay, which is why it has lived um, a life much longer than it should have lived. Um, so, you know, you have this formula, you know, you do this and you, know, you have the opening paragraph, you have three support paragraphs at each of those support paragraphs, you have the three, three pieces of evidence, you develop the evidence, last paragraph you get out of it, and, and it's great, it's fine, the structure's there. But it, it, kills, it kills the idea of the fact that ideas um, don't always fit that form. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to teach process, it's a way to teach structure, but then pulling the structure away and having kids um, figure out if an idea needs five pieces of evidence and some of them stronger and some less strong and how do you organize that and how does that actually look and shape, they can come up with that, they can make that up. It can be legitimate because it's theirs. So that we're fooling around with ways to have that happen. So we're switching, we're doing shorter we're doing a lot of shorter pieces where kids take an idea and expand it as much as they can to get used to the idea of how do you make an argument. I mean, an argument is something that we just that we do, you know. And you know, I I used to do some correcting of the freshman um, the freshman place in pa papers for MIT. They just sort of brought a bunch of people in to sort of read these papers that high school seniors who were accepted were doing. And if a kid had a paper that was a five paragraph essay, we, we just put it in the bin. You know, the kid just had to sort of take basic remedial English again. It wasn't a good thing. No one likes that five paragraph essay because it, it limits creativity and it doesn't, it shows no, no, you know, no sense of how really an argument should be formed and how your head works. So to answer your question, we do it all, we do the process pieces all along, and then we play around with the various forms that those arguments could take. Can I just interject? Um, I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but it warmed my heart that two of the social studies people behind you went like, ah, <laughs> claims and evidence. And um, we have been working a lot as a curriculum team on transferable skills, and that's one of the key transferable skills. So while they're talking about <coughs> developing those skills in English language arts, we're also developing those skills across all subject areas. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad you could come.
so I can speak to the same thing as going on in the middle school for right. sure. Right. Yes. And, and the elementary as well. And so I think that that's one of the points is that we as a curriculum team, including the literacy specialists for the elementary school and the math coaches will talk about what are those transferable skills. And those are the skills that are going to help students to handle non regular problems when they have the ability to take or, or projects when, when they have those that bag of skills that they can just take and, and transfer to a, another subject area and they're used to that. And by asking them to do SpongeBob SquarePants against another text gets the, the idea that two things that look very dissimilar could can have similarities. Yeah, thanks. Great. Uh, Mr. Cochran, uh, um, please come up. I know we saw you um, about a year ago and so this is um, just a nice uh, update about what's um, been going on in the past year and what your, your, your thoughts are for the coming years. <coughs> and I know you have some colleagues, so uh, <laughs> please introduce them and speak, I'll speak into the microphone. Yes, so very happy to be here with all of you tonight. Um, and I brought two of my wonderful colleagues with me. Um, Kristen Watchelhausen, who is a sixth grade ancient civilizations teacher, and Tom Bushel, who is also a sixth grade ancient civilizations teacher. So they're gonna talk more about some of the exciting things going on in our sixth grade curriculum uh, once we get a little overview of things. Um, but I appreciate you bringing up that it was about a year ago that I was here yeah. because at that point, you know, my eyes were open really wide. I was trying to learn about the students, about the district, about the curriculum, um, learning about the teachers. And it's so crazy to think about how much has happened in the past year, how much I've learned and just the work that we've done and the work that we have going forward. Mm -hmm. um, to start off, we have two pieces of very, very good news. Um, first one is that our um, Odyssey National History Day students, we have 10 teams that are moving on to the state competition wow. now. Um, and Tom Bushell is one of the advisors this year, along <laughs> with Jason Levy. So we're really excited about that. Um, Odyssey is always well represented at states and at national, so that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one of our other sixth grade teachers who's here tonight, Allison Sansonito, um, has been selected as the Mass Council for Social Studies Middle School Social Studies Teacher of the Year. Uh, so we're also very excited about that. Um, so lots of wonderful things to lead off. Um, so it has been a really, really great year um, in multiple different ways. The top is a group of fourth graders at Bishop that I got to spend a lot of time with. They wanted to just ask me questions about the election process, and I sat there for 40 minutes, um, and it was a really, really, really great conversation that we had together. Um, then the bottom is a group of students from the high school. Uh, this year I'm co-teaching a class with um, one of our first year teachers, and we took a field trip to the Ted Kennedy Institute yeah. where they all got to be different senators and argue about immigration bills. Um, so mm -hmm. I feel like I've been here, there, and everywhere this year, but it's been great. Um, so to go over some things, we'll kind of go over what we've done this past year, and then we'll go over um, looking forward, what we have look, to look forward to. Uh, the biggest district-wide initiative was the election. Um, and this was something that I never thought would be so complicated in all the years that I've been in education so far. Um, one of the things we did this summer is we got a group of teachers together to come up with um, some guidelines for teaching the electives, uh, the election, they researched resources, websites, readings, and we broke it down grade by grade about you know, what are the appropriate things for a first grader to be learning about the election? What are the appropriate things for a second grader to be learning? When do we even want to introduce the ideas that there's two political parties? Mm -hmm. um, so I feel really happy that we put together a really nice guide that the teachers, specifically the K through five teachers, use to teach the election. Um, you know, kindergarten, first grade, we didn't necessarily even talk about Trump and Hillary Clinton. Um, instead, students got to read about two different literary characters and vote for which one they like better. Uh, so we figured leave the politics out, but let them understand what this process of voting and um, what democracy really looks like in a different piece. Um, so there were lots of mock debates at the high school. Um, students were debating the Massachusetts ballot questions. We had um, mock elections um, from the middle school and the high school to see who our students would choose. Um, and what, the, what could have been a very thorny subject, I really applaud the teachers and administrators in the district for doing a fantastic job of making sure that there could be good conversations, making sure that people felt comfortable regardless of their political beliefs. Um, so that's all the teachers that did that amazing work on the election. Um, but that's one of the things that we're really proud of this past year is the work on the election. Uh, so K through five this past year, some new developments. Um, in second grade, we added a new unit. 
Uh, we added the Tio Sente and El Salvador unit that was in fourth grade, and we moved that to second grade. Um, so now in second grade, it's wonderful. Students are doing Tio Sente and El Salvador, and they're also doing our sister city um, in Japan. So it's a nice comparison for the students. Um, students at the end of the year are going to come together and um, do a project that has them compare life in Tio Sente, life in Japan, and life in Arlington. Um, so we're really excited about the level of synthesis and compare and contrast that second graders are going to be able to do. Um, in third, fourth, and fifth grade, you can see a picture of me, Linda Hansen and Tammy McBride up there, our literacy coaches. Uh, we spent a lot of summer, a lot of the summer with um, elementary school teachers working on integrated English language arts and social studies units, uh, making sure that students can see those clear connections between history and between what they're reading and writing. Uh, so we worked on them for third grade, a unit on the pilgrims, fourth grade, a unit on immigration, and fifth grade, a unit on the American Revolution. Um, and this summer, we're going to be working on another one um, for first grade, which we're excited about as well. Uh, so teachers are piloting these units this year. We're going to come back together over the summer, see what worked, see what didn't work, and uh, go from there, really. Um, then another great thing that we had is some good PD for the fifth grade. Uh, the organization Children Discovering Justice, we had come in and do a uh, fifth grade PD. Discovering Justice is based out of the Moakley Courthouse. It's all about civics. It's all about having students understand big questions like what is a right, what is fair, what is a law, what is a rule. Um, so they did some work with the fifth grade um, teachers to get them familiar with the curriculum and see if this was a curriculum that we wanted to pursue. So K through five, moving forward, one of the of the projects over the next year is geography benchmarks for each grade K through five. Uh, we want to have a nice level of horizontal alignment across the different schools. So make sure that every second grader by the end of the year is having common experiences and knowing common terms and locations and places. Uh, so we're going to be working with our seventh grade world geography teachers to see when you get them in seventh grade, what do you need them to know and then work backwards from that point. Uh, the integration of civics is another really important thing. I mean, a lot of the meetings that I've been in with the uh, Department of Education, they said civics is the biggest change that's going to come with history. We really want to emphasize civics and the integration of civics throughout all disciplines. Uh, so we're continuing to look at the different ways that we can integrate civics within the curriculums, regardless of the content. And then in fifth grade, we're going to start our curriculum revision this upcoming summer, um, where we're going to focus more on depth versus breadth. Um, rather than try to do, cover a very large historical time period, we're going to really focus in on the American Revolution and the U.S. Constitution to really get at that idea of civics so that when students are done in fifth grade, they have a very, very solid understanding of how our government works and ways that they can participate in their government. Uh, getting to Odyssey this past year, the sixth grade did a very, very exciting curriculum rewrite of ancient civilizations curriculum. We moved from a chronological approach to a thematic approach, and I'm going to let them talk about all of that in a moment. Um, in seventh grade, we had new textbooks this year, and we were using now in the seventh grade a digital textbook, which is really exciting. Um, and it's been very, very successful this year. Having um, these up-to-date books and resources has been very beneficial for the teachers and the students. Um, and in eighth grade, um, along with this idea of thinking about difference and how we get along with each other, uh, we've been integrating some of my previous life at Facing History um, by this uh, wonderful case study they have about the French headscarf debate in France to help students understand what religious pluralism look like, looks like. Um, and oftentimes it's easy for students, or it's easier for students to think about these issues in another country's context and then bring it back to where they live and think about their own lives. That's the goal. Uh, with this student as well. Um, moving forward for Audison, the sixth grade, they're going to continue to fine tune the curriculum. Again, this summer, there's a lot of time allotted for them to re examine what worked and what didn't work. I think they've learned different things every day about the curriculum, so have I. Um, in seventh grade, we're looking at ways to incorporate more writing into world geography curriculum and technology. Um, Julie Keyes, who's here also from the history department, uh, experimented this year with Google Expeditions. Um, so we want to integrate that into all the grades, but seventh grade world geography fits really well. So um, Google Expeditions is nice because it's a virtual reality experience where students can have their iPads or their phones, and they can be wandering through the streets of Italy. They can be, you know, at Normandy Beach on D-Day, you know, coming out for one of the boats onto the beach. Um, so it's a, I think it's going to change the way that we teach history, and we're excited about that as well. Um, in eighth grade, we're going to continue to incorporate more civics. Um, and we've had a wonderful experience with the Medieval Building Project. And we're going to continue to look at that and think about new ways to approach that. Um, students love that project. They talk about it until they get to high school. 
Uh, but we also know that our students are changing. Technology is more pervasive. Um, so we want to see, are there different ways for students to show their understanding of their knowledge of medieval buildings and structures um, in that type of way. Then finally getting to the high school, um, one of the things that we did last year is we had common final exams. So every 9th, 10th, and 11th grader took the same exam. Because of that, uh, I sound like Matt Coleman here. Uh, we were able to get some rich data from it <laughs> that we analyzed and I put into spreadsheets and it was very exciting. Um, and then just recently we were doing some grading calibration. Um, so we had essays from the final exams as we're looking towards rewriting them for this year. And we just sat together grading and um, talking about the ways that we were grading. So it was nice to get us all on the same page there. Um, inspired by our sixth grade teachers, our ninth grade is now looking at a curriculum revision. Uh, as you might know, the ninth grade curriculum is modern world history. Um, in learning about the curriculum last year, I realized that it was not modern, nor was it representative of the world. Because um, we were ending around World War II, and it was very heavily focused on European history. Um, this is the one chance I think students have to get into you know, the history of the Middle East, get into interesting topics like apartheid, understand revolution in Latin America. So we want to make sure that the curriculum reflects um, a knowledge of those things. Um, so they're looking at right now, we're just at the beginning processes of making that a thematic curriculum rather than a chronological curriculum. Um, in 10th and 11th grade, which are U.S. history courses, their PLC work this year and the work that they've done has been on integrating diverse narratives into the curriculum. Um, so we've been looking at ways in U.S. 1, for example, where we want to look at African Americans not just through the lens of slavery or as victims, but talk about the cultural achievements, um, talk about the rich culture that some of them developed while they were on plantations, um, talking about Native American history, and we've had some really cool connections in US 1 this year by thinking about the pipeline that's brought Native American affairs to current events for students. Um, and next year at the high school, we'll be offering two new electives, History of Massachusetts and History of the Modern Middle East. So we're always excited to continue to expand our electives <coughs> offerings for students. Um, next up at, uh, well here you can see some highlights from the past year at the high school from the Ted Kennedy Institute. Uh, the technology has been great this year. We've done a lot of Skyping. So we've had scholars, I know Kristen had a scholar on Egypt Skype in with her class. Um, we've had um, various people, New York Times editors, New York Times writers. Um, we had, I'm blanking on his name because I'm in front of a microphone right now, um, <laughs> but he was the chief translator for Nixon on his trip to China, and he Skyped in with our uh, seniors and juniors. So. Even though we can't bring all these people into our classrooms, we're still having really meaningful exchanges with scholars and academics, which is great. HS, moving forward, we're going to continue with our ninth grade curriculum work. Uh, we're going to continue to evaluate the 10th and 11th grade curriculum, knowing that the Department of Ed is aiming for around 2019 to update the Massachusetts Social Studies frameworks. Uh, so I'm trying to stay ahead of that as much as possible, um, because who knows, what, who knows what's going to be on the table with that. Um, we're always looking to see whether or not we should be expanding our AP program. So two APs that we're currently reviewing are AP Human Geography and AP World History. Um, we are looking at a potential partnership with Middlesex Community College to be able to offer um, three MCC credits, college credits to students for completing economics classes, American law classes, and psychology classes. Um, and as my wonderful English colleague said, this idea of research, research skills, source reliability, corroborating sources, um, has been something that's been really, really important to us that we're continuing to think about as a department, think about just as adults when we're having our conversations and how we get students to try to understand that. Um, so that picture there is from one of our New York Times Upfront magazine that students get um, talking about fake news and some of the activities that students did around that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to two representatives from our awesome sixth grade team, um, Kristen and Tom, and they're going to Go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so last year we got really lucky. Um, Denny came in and he gave us uh, the gift of reflective practice, which we're often given and asked to do um, in our own personal practice, but it's rare that as a collective sixth grade, you are kind of given the ability to reflect as an entire grade as teachers and, and look deeply at the curriculum and how it could be improved and how its effectiveness is translating into the classroom. Um, and when we did this, we decided that there was 
a whole bunch missing. There were gaps between major connections that were being made. I know, at least in my classroom, a ton of the students would think that when we stopped the Egypt unit means that ancient Egypt stopped <laughs> and then we moved on to the next civilization. So they were really missing a lot of the rich and deep connections that you can make in the ancient world, um, especially with the interconnectedness and the way that they're um, constantly influencing each other. Um, so we kind of started from square one and said if we were to build a curriculum around ancient civilizations um, and pair it with the skills that we really want our kids to leave the classroom with and go on into their academic careers. Um, what, what should we look for? What do we want? Um, so one was definitely what skills do we think they need not only in history but in cross-curricular because a lot of what the English department was talking about we also strive to do with uh, the claim and evidence-based writing just um, to name one example. Um, and then we also wanted to think about um, the whole civics. How are our lessons meaningful to the students? How do they connect to their lives and what's going on in the world today. Um, next, we thought about this great gift that was given to us in technology. We have the iPads at our fingertips, and that really allows the students to do more inquiry and project-based learning. Um, and we find that with that and with the use of that technology and all the information at their fingertips, they're really able to produce substantial work with deeper connections um, and connections not only between civilizations but in the modern world and in their own lives. So we've had some really great um, production as far as that goes. Um, it also allows us to teach with a little bit more flexibility as far as the civilizations go. So we're able to kind of throw in a couple more civilizations that we weren't looking at before, like the Indus River Valley, um, the Persian Empire, Kush Mesoamerica. Um, and we don't necessarily use these with every project and, and everything that we do. Um, but there are a lot of students I know that sometimes felt misrepresented. We have a lot of students from India, and they often and would ask or their parents would, why don't we learn about India and ancient civilizations? So it really gives them more ownership over the curriculum and a lot of times they get to choose certain civilizations um, as an independent project or as a connection that they want to learn about. Um, so that's a really great addition. Uh, we also really wanted to make sure that students were able to compare, evaluate, and examine history rather than just memorizing it. Mm -hmm. In my classroom, I got rid of tests all together and we've really been doing in Korean project-based learning and activity hands-on things where they're able to own the material and not just kind of regurgitate it which I say often in the classroom and they laugh at me but that's that's really what happens a lot of the times on testing and then the information's gone and it's not a skill and a fundamental um, thing that they've learned and they can take with them in their educational careers it's it's then gone to make space for the next thing to memorize um, so we found great luck in that and we think that they own the material a lot more based on that approach. Um, and it also allows us to accommodate various styles of learning, um, not just to our special education children, which it definitely does, but also to our more gifted students who are often looking for a bit more of a challenge, especially with integrating the technology into that. We have a lot more freedom to allow them to stretch and challenge themselves um, as often and as frequently as as they can. Nice. Um, so up here on the board you can see uh, this is the current AP world history themes uh, and I'm not going to read them out to you but you can see that this is what we used as our inspiration when we were uh, looking for something to model our curriculum after. So we added one right before theme one. We just wanted to get that foundation skills um, how do you study history? What is an artifact? What's a primary source? What's a secondary source? Um, but then we moved on to trying to model after this list because to master these uh, to master these themes, you really need a lot more higher order thinking skills, a lot more critical thinking skills that we were really hoping to to push them towards, as opposed to rote memorization of names and dates uh, and the like. So. Yeah, great. And we also, Denny was talking um, about vertical alignment, and we were thinking about that too when we were looking at the curriculum. What are they doing at the high school, and what are skills that we can start working on in the middle school that they can then utilize and have a foundation for when they get there? Um, so theme one, thinking like a historian, this is, we spend a lot of time in the beginning thinking about kind of cross-curricular cross questioning. So in history, in science, in a lot of different areas, um, we 
kind of study based on questions that we come up with. And so learning how to question um, is really important. So that's where we start. And with that, we also talk about um, archaeology and look at specific applications of that questioning, not only within archaeology, but within um, prehistory and specific artifacts within prehistory that we can then start that inquiry-based uh, research and development. Um, our next theme is interactions between human and the environment. And what we really wanted to do here is this would have been geography, but we wanted to do more than what we typically did with geography because there's so much more you can do. So not only do we focus on geography um, of a civilization, but we focus on how that geography, how those physical features impact the people that live there, and then how do those people in turn impact their environment and their geography, which really lends itself to thinking about, okay, now thinking in modern terms, especially with um, modern technology, how has that then changed how humans impact their environment and how environment impacts humans. So we do like a really great environmental study um, for the kids and they kind of can see what's going on now that we have all this new technology and how does that change the way we impact um, our environment. Um, theme three is the development of culture, which we've been spending a lot of time, and we've been noticing there's so many ways to investigate culture. Um, so right now, for example, the students are um, doing a passport to the ancient world, um, and they're actually flying to the different civilizations, and they're experiencing it, not only just answering questions, but if you're putting yourself in the shoes of the ancient people, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you tasting? So it's those higher order thinking skills that's making them apply what they learn to actually kind of have a simulation of an experience of what it would be like to, in fact, live there during that time. Um, so this is about where we are at the moment. We're wrapping up the culture unit. And part of the beauty of this pilot year is that we have the flexibility to try different things in our classrooms and then sort of regroup at the end of the year and see what worked and see what didn't work. Um, so while some classes are doing that passport to the ancient world, uh, others might be doing a research project or, or some kind of comparative activity where you examine cultures of your chosen civilizations uh, and make connections that way. But next up, we have power expansion and conflict, which is where we'll look at things like government, uh, nations coming into conflict, related to today's world as often as possible. Uh, we'll do inventions after that, and then we'll finish it off with trade networks, just to, again, try to build up as much connectivity as we can and really give them a, a global, this is all happening at the same time feel. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where yeah. we're heading. Yeah, and I think what's really great about this and with the themes is um, Eli was talking about patterns. And so in, in teaching in a theme with something like power expansion and conflict, they're able to see all of this unfolding together. They're able to see the patterns, how one is affecting the other and how things are actually playing out, seeing different perspectives versus just seeing a one-sidedness of these are the causes of the Persian War from this perspective. So they're getting more of a global approach all the time as we're looking at it and being able to make more deep and meaningful connections. Um, so we're really excited about the end of the year assessment that we came up with this year, um, mostly because just as ELA was talking about, a lot of times the students are able to engage more and give um, a better final product when they're able to choose how they show what they learn. And that's something that I've been doing in my classroom um, since I've been here and I, I really enjoy how much better the final product comes out when the kids are more engaged in it, when they are more invested in it, because they're taking ownership of it, because they are able to choose how they're going to show you what they know. So we've decided every theme, they're collecting a piece from this theme. And so we've started kind of these portfolios for them, some of us digitally, some, some in paper, some um, kind of mentally. But they're taking an element from each theme, and they're taking ownership of it. And at the end of the year, they're going to create their own civilization based on pieces and connections that they've made over the course of the year. So it's kind of um, a, a worldly perspective of what they've learned, just trying to add on the comparisons and the deeper comparisons that we want them to make all year long. Um, so for my uh, class so far, they um, created a physical features ad based on the ad that they think would most benefit civilizations to live near. And that is one of the physical features they have to include in their civilization at the end of the year. They created a super god 
God that is composed of all different elements of gods of all different cultures of the ancient world. And that is a God that they will have to include in their civilization at the end of the year. So not only do we want them to examine closely and apply um, their knowledge and their connections while they're in these themes, but we also want them to be able to carry that on and to be able to show what they've learned throughout the year. Um, in Minecraft or in a poster or in a model and something that they will be able to apply all that knowledge um, and be really proud of and be able to kind of take that with them and use that understanding of what they've learned in the connections um, in the different groups of settlements of people in the world um, and carry that on into their other history classrooms. Great, thank you very much. Um, questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Hainer. I have a question and a comment. Uh, you do enjoy what you're doing, don't you? <laughs> yes, Absolutely, I, yeah. we do. <laughs> and I gotta say, I think that's the best part of teaching, to get paid to do something you really enjoy. Yeah. Thank you very much for everything, it's exciting. You know, every time I hear this, I'm like, oh, I wish I could go back to sixth yeah. grade, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sounds really cool. Yeah, it's, it's yes. great. Well, yeah. we're, we're really lucky. I mean, we wouldn't have been given this opportunity if it wasn't for Denny, so Absolutely. we're very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Slickman. I noticed uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you have a APS history department uh, Twitter account, which I just hit, and it seems you're doing selfie station exit tickets in yes. sixth grade? Yes. So Allison has a Twitter account. I had a Twitter account, but I only created it when Zahi Huas, the former Secretary of Antiquities for Egypt, Skyped with my class because uh -huh. I saw he had one. So I tweeted it and he retweeted it and then I, I just quit Twitter right then because I thought <laughs> it's never going to top this. <laughs> but um, yes, Allison tweets out, so we're doing the Passport to the Ancient World right now. And after they visit their homework assignment for this whole week, is they're tweeting out um, their experience and the, the civilization that they're in. So they're not actually doing it on Twitter, they're doing it on Google classroom, but we created a forum for them to be able to do that. So they're having a lot of fun with that. I thought it was quite impressive that we had a student, uh, two students on the Great Wall of yes. China. Yes, <laughs> there is an amazing green screen app that is only $2.99 that comes in very handy. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's, it's, it's fortunate it's a low budget item. We have somebody on the shoulder of a stack. This is great stuff. I, you know, it's got to be fun. Yeah. It's very fun. The kids like it. <laughs> Mr. Carton. Uh, okay, thanks. I, I wasn't here last year, so I, I did see your presentation today, but I wasn't here to ask questions. So um, not specifically on the sixth grade, but um, I, I drove a son that's in the seventh grade and a daughter in the fifth grade, and um, they're still being required to learn, this is my pet peeve, state capitals and country capitals. And that seems way out of line with, uh, with all what you're doing in the, in the sixth grade. Do you see it moving forward, moving away from that kind of stuff, or is that still, I certainly can understand them needing to know where countries are, but memorizing a list of state capitals and country capitals just seems so old school. Um, I completely agree with you that type of memorization, some of it is very, very beneficial for students, as you noted. Um, but I also didn't want to come in and uproot everybody <laughs> in my first, yeah. first and second year. So a lot of it is, you know, I'm having conversations with teachers. I'm asking them questions, um, you know, even at the high school where some teachers are having students take notes on the textbook for homework. I'm saying, is this a meaningful assignment? Uh, similar to what uh, Deb Perry was saying, I asked one of my teachers a question. I said, you know, if it's this easy to cheat and to copy an assignment, does that mean it's meaningful? Yeah. Uh, because now you can go online, find any textbook, and find somebody who's taken notes on that textbook and just copy and paste that. It's, it's crazy. So that we've been thinking about this idea of meaningful. We've been thinking about this idea of um, the application of skills and what that means. Uh, so it's a direction that I hope social studies goes on throughout the district, and we're chipping away at it little by little. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's very Thank exciting. You. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So I know we are a little behind. Um, we have a very full agenda. Uh, next on the agenda is the superintendent's recommendations for the circuit breaker. And this is um, our last meeting. We voted to um, potentially use uh, 300,000 of the circuit breaker money uh, for, for next year's expenses. Um, this is money that wouldn't be available usually until, until subsequent years, but, um, but our vote was to use it for next year. And um, we directed Dr. Bodie to come back to us with some suggestions about how she would use that money. 
Yeah, so this is what that is. And the, we discussed this at the budget subcommittee this week and a, and a copy of the recommendations um, are in your, uh, in Novus. But let me just go through them because people listening would not be able to, um, to access that right now anyway. So it's 300,000 and that's what we were aiming for. And looking at what, would, what were the asks, what were some of the areas that we felt that we really did need to have some extra uh, funding. And one, of course, we've talked about is reserve teaching positions. We have two in the budget as it stands. This uh, additional money would allow one additional at, um, it, it, at a rate that we would have a, 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 um, an elementary teacher. Mm -hmm. There's also um, an additional FTE of, uh, of a teacher FTE for the high school for a combination of academics and administration. Um, I've had conversations with um, the principal of the high school um, and, and curriculum leaders about where are areas that we need to expand uh, different uh, offerings, both for core classes as well as electives. And originally, the high school had asked for 2.7, and even that had been pared down. Over the last few years, the high school has really not been given um, a, a lot of additional uh, FTEs, and yet the number of students that have, have entered the high school has been increasing. And we're going to see an increase next year also somewhere between 60 and 70 students. So the, the high school is, is very close to um, having students select their courses. So how this actually gets distributed, so three, with this 1.0 and the other 2.0, how it gets distributed remains to be seen with respect to um, the, the choices of students. But in, included in this is some money for mis extra administrative help. Can I, can I ask you a question? Would there be a single person who is both an administrator and a teacher? Yes. So that would potentially be a union issue, right? For It would be a union that. issue that we'll have discussions about. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. As we do on many topics like, right. like this, we do. All right, and the other, so that was the, the high school. Um, we also know that we, we probably have an in, inadequate number of reserve teaching assistant positions. Currently in the budget, we would have five in reserve. This would allow us another four. And I have, I just want to mention it here. I, I've had a couple of emails recently. I think maybe some of you have too uh, from parents concerned about teaching assistance in the kindergarten. And, and I can tell and I, uh, from the, uh, at least one in particular, there's a misconception that we are not having the current level of <coughs> TA support that we have next year, and that's not the case. We have half-time TAs right now in all of our kindergartens. Some kindergartens actually have a full-time TA, and those choices have been made for a uh, a couple of considerations. One might be a one-to-one -one teaching aide who then also supports the student and, and is, is in the classroom. But we also have a few large, cla large classroom TAs as well. So, but the, the, all of our kindergarten teachers next year will have a half-time teaching assistant as they've had. In fact, that was a really important choice we made a year ago because when the kindergarten grant uh, was no longer funded by the, the state, we had to make that decision as to whether we were going to actually move that, in, move teaching assistance in the kindergarten into the operating budget, and we, we did do that. Um, to have full-time teaching assistance, we're, we're talking in the neighborhood of an additional $200,000. Someday. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some additional um, a district professional development that was not addressed in the uh, the other budget, and one in one uh, in particular that we felt very strongly about, but hadn't included at the time, and that is a continuation of our week-long summer uh, course on responsive classrooms for elementary teachers. There, there is a tremendous demand for wanting to be in that course. 
and it's, it's a fairly expensive course to, to, uh, to offer, but this will give us uh, that opportunity. And we just, the only thing that hasn't happened yet is deciding on the week. We also talked in the budget about having um, uh, part-time, half-time assistant principals in a couple schools as a pilot. And, uh, but the, the money that was allocated in terms of two FTEs at the administrative level wasn't quite sufficient for every principal to have some additional support. And so this ad just small additional amount um, of 25,000 will help to make sure that every teacher has, uh, every principal has some support. And the preferred support for a number of our principals is to have another behavior support per person in the building. Um, then uh, we, there was some con concern expressed at this table about the building subs being reduced at the middle school and the high school. And so this restores a building, uh, a building sub both at the high school and at the, at the middle school. And then lastly, one area that we have, we've, had, we've done some work with, with um, math, elementary math intervention is through the Title I. We are concerned that Title I may even be more reduced than we think it will be when we first um, put in the budget what the revenue would be from Title I. As we were hearing about the block grants, a, there is a move at the part of Washington right now to really contract um, entitlement grants. So this is, you know, if, if we don't have a contraction, then this will also give us a way to be able to um, help more students who, that need some uh, support. Right now at the elementary level, we have people, coaches for our teachers. Um, and this, this person would work actually with students that have been identified that need extra support. So you total this and you come to 300,000. And there's one other change um, in the budget that I do want to mention tonight. It, in terms of money, there's no change, but in terms of what it would be. In the, in the other budget, not of the budget, the budget that's been proposed, we, we asked for uh, two learning specialists at the elementary. And after more discussion with principals, um, we decided that it probably would be more beneficial, and given the caseloads that the department has looked at, to have one learning specialist and have a, another literacy coach. Right now we have two literacy coaches who are being stretched tremendously. And I think the one thing you heard from the teachers at the, uh, at the elementary level is that they want more of that type of support, and they also want more teaching assistance. So they want more support. And so that's why we've made that adjustment. Right. OK, so um, now uh, open it to discussion, um, like questions, comments, similar type of thing on, on the proposal. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I just want to say, so budget met on Monday, mm -hmm. and we did hear the um, additions that you heard proposed, and we uh, made a motion which passed to move that the committee approve the additions as proposed. Not to say we can't mm -hmm. discuss it, but right. um, you want I'd a like second? to bring that motion forward. Second. No, that was our, okay. oh, that's the motion making tonight or that was the motion you're reporting that on? That was the motion that we made for, t I mean, we're bringing this mo You're bringing the motion tonight. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Right. And second. then, and, and Mr. Thielman is seconding it. Great. Okay. All right. So, uh, discussion on the motion then. Okay. That's Good. Mr. Hayner. I just want to be on the record as saying that I personally believe for educational reasons a full-time aid kindergarten in all kindergartens is essential because the year is a prescriptive year to develop the diagnosis going forward. Early identification of developmental, educational, psychological needs is most important. It's financially beneficial to identify early and uh, remediate as early as you can. I've said this before, it's not new. Mr. Cardin. Yes, and I'll just chime in as well that, I mean, it was the administration that made the choice to move with principal support rather than, rather than doing the full-time kindergarten mm -hmm. TAs. So certainly if people are concerned about that, they can talk to their principals and get more feedback on why that choice was made. Okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna, oh, Mr. Schlickman, yeah. I, I just wanna note that uh, 
Uh, our schools have expanded tremendously over the past few years. Uh, we've added over 500 students in the past three years. Our enrollment's gone up 10%. Um, much of this enrollment increase has been at the elementary level. And the model of a principal and a uh, secretary or clerk um, being responsible for building work uh, 15 years ago when the enrollments were in the two three hundreds and we're pushing 500 kids and um, leadership matters and if principals do not receive sufficient support they're going to start looking for positions elsewhere where they're going to have the support and infrastructure to do the job the state has come forth with a lot of additional requirements in terms of staff evaluation it is an onerous task to do that alone. Uh, we want our principals to be instructional leaders and not doing administrivia. Um, in order to make the school really great, our instructional leaders need to be free to do that work. And every year they've come before us unselfishly looking to move money to teaching in classrooms. This year, the teachers came into this room and said our principals need help. Our administrators need help. They're overwhelmed. And to move into support for the administrative leaders of this district is essential for us to maintain quality education in the building. Jay Thielman. I just have two questions. The total number of reserved teaching positions in the district now and the budget will be? Three. It'll be three for the whole district. Okay. And, well, I think more realistically three at the elementary because the additional FTEs at the high school will fill that gap. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the okay and the academic and the uh, the FTE at the high school. I was wasn't I was reading something else. That's what was it? That's the dean position. Is that what that is? It says it's a combination. Um, the uh, dean position could be a point for more than likely that's what it would be next year with the idea that this is going to evolve into a full-time position. Being teaching, being teaching. It's a combination and we'll work, we'll work on <clears throat> with the union and how that, that looks. Okay, and then I just want to say the thing I think I always say is that we, you know, we pass this and then, mm. you know, the superintendent has discretion over the course of the summer to fill positions based mm -hmm. on, right. you know, availability. So just so everyone's aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hainer. I just want to make it clear. I am not suggesting that we should not listen to the principles, not listen to the requests. I just feel that it is very, it is paramount in my mind as a former educator, as one who's done a lot of research in early childhood development, the importance of that. I'm not, I don't want us to be in a position either or, mm -hmm. and I would like it to be found somewhere else. I just want to make it clear mm -hmm. that I'm not opposing any of the things that are going in and being added. I think they're all necessary in going forward. Thank you. So I'd like to open a can of worms, and I'm just opening it. I'm not advocating for it necessarily. I just wanted to say maybe we should discuss it next year, um, which is that um, our relationship with the state funding formula in Chapter 70 means that additional kids no longer give us as much additional chapter 78, which means if we were to reinstitute small kindergarten fees, we wouldn't lose any money from that. No, I know, I know, I'm not, I'm not advocating it. I'm no, just no, 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 it won't work. You can't. You can't. Oh, oh. you can't. You cannot institute a kindergarten fee for a full-time kindergarten. For a full-time kindergarten, because what what has happened as oh. a result? Okay. Um, we had the, the the once you go to full time, you can't go back to half time. And the thing is, is that when we were at half time, uh, we were technically half time and half time and offering the other half for a fee. Yeah. Um, we were only getting aid based on half time student. And right, but the formula has changed. Well, for no, that. no, 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 no. The the, yeah, the so formula saying. the formula itself hasn't changed, but um, we would not gain anything by giving back. Um, the, the full-time position in charging money. We would only be hurting the uh, kindergarten parents. Um, okay. I, I, as I understand it, the, the, you know, because we've gotten wealthier, we don't get additional Chapter 78 well, no, in the, that the way. The thing but, is, no, but, the, the um, reason why the Chapter 78 is, de is lagging is because the governor has not inf properly inflated the uh, underlying Chapter 70 right. budget. 
Right. Okay. Uh, and so that more and more cost is being placed onto cities and towns because as the underlying Chapter 70 cost is underinflated, that means the, share, the state's share is, is compressed because okay. we still have a formula-based uh, minimum local contribution. Uh, which we have right. to meet, but right. if the state says it costs less to educate kids, it's their right. no, share I know that goes a, down. So. Now, the, the big action item we have before us, if we want our Chapter 70 money to go back up where it should, is to uh, make sure that this millionaire's tax passes next year. That's, and, and put pressure back on the state right. th to say that they have an obligation to fulfill. Okay, All right. their, so their, I, their as share. I said, I was just, I was just, far, far, I didn't, far, I didn't, far, I wasn't far, advocating far. for it. I was just wanted to say, throw it out and let's look at the analysis next year. That was, that was all I wanted to. I didn't want to. Um, I want to speak to her. Okay, go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I should. So, I think Ms. Dr. Seuss is correct that it might not affect how much money came into Chapter 70 if we were to switch back. Right. However, I think it would change our relationship with the town. Right now, we get almost a million dollars earmarked as in lieu of con right. kindergarten tuition, so that money would go right, away. Right. So there would be more money coming into the town coffers. I mean, that, you know, because it wouldn't be coming to us. Mm -hmm. Anyways, no, I don't think it's a good idea. Okay, again, I said I wasn't necessarily advocating. I was okay. just like, yeah. Uh, anyway, probably yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so let's vote on. Um, Dr. Alice Manvey's motion, um, seconded by Mr. Thielman. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, so six in favor, one opposed. Five. Oh, sorry, five. five. You're right. Five, I was five, counting five. wrong. Yes, exactly, five because um, Dr. Yeah, Ms. Starks is not here. Um, okay, so um, do we have additional? So now we have to move to the budget, to the, the final budget. So is I, there a, I move approval of the budget as amended by the, by budget, the budget subcommittee's subcommit amendment. Okay. Uh, Second. Motion uh, seconded by Mr. Cardin, Mr. Thielman. Um, any discussion of that motion? Mr. Hainer. I will vote no as I did before for the reasons I've stated before. Okay. Thank you. I, would, I feel it should be increased. Okay. Entire budget. Okay. Any other discussion? Dr. Allison Eppie? I'm going to vote for it. I am, as Mr. Hainer feels, we need more money, and there's places where I feel we're not doing as good a job as we could be if we had more money. But I think that this is a reasonable allocation of the funds that we were given, and by staying within our budget this year, um, I think this is a good thing for where we may need to go next year. Okay, so um, motions on the table and seconded. Um, all in favor of passing the budget as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, so that is 5 1. Okay, um, so now we have uh, a discussion and approval uh, for the Principal Gibbs School job description. And Dr. Bodie, do you want to give us some background? Uh, yes, we. We are um, presenting to you tonight, and I'll have Mr. Spiegel speak to it, um, a new job description. This is a new position in the district, and when we do have a new position, we bring forward to you the job description for your approval. Um, and that was, you've had that in, in Novus. So our plan is once we have approval for the job description, then we will go forward with a posting of this position and go through the process we usually do and in which we have a, um, uh, a selection, a search committee that will meet with candidates and we already have the uh, people selected from the AEA as well as I believe we have the, uh, we have parent representation and we also have uh, representation from AAA. Mm -hmm. So we're ready, to, we're ready to go and, but this is, before we can actually post it, we need to have your approval. And so I don't know if Mr. Speaker would like to speak a little bit to it. Um, anything that's any different than any of our other principal um, job descriptions? No, I mean, I think this was based, it took a lot of, you know, based on what was in existence at the Audison principal position description and, and revised it, amended it to um, be more specific to the sixth grade. Um, 
a little ways, but I mean, a lot of, you know, what the a principal does in um, our schools is, is similar in any of the schools. So, um, you know, this is, uh, but this is a new type of building for Arlington with just one grade and what that's going to mean. And so, um, and the other thing that's different is we are posting for the position, we will post for it now at this time of year and hope to hire someone um, this spring. And the position would officially begin in July of 2018. However, we would appoint someone um, for the 17-18 school year on a stipend basis most likely um, to be involved in the planning um, process but that person wouldn't it would not be their full-time job to be the Gibbs principal for the 1718 year they would be it would become their full-time job in beginning in 18 July of 2018 mm -hmm. okay yes mr. Thielman so just time of course so you post it now you hire the person they'll be part of the district They'll be somewhere in the, presumably working in the, one of the schools. And then, right. and then, and, and, and you're also going to, uh, as soon as you post this, you'll invite people to form a committee to be on so the So we already, yeah, we I mean, already so have, we've already, the AEA has already chosen the all, representatives to this committee. Um, there might be some, I know some parents uh, that the superintendent reached out to district administrators will be part of the committee that that I don't think it's been completely finalized but um, we will have yeah, I think it'd be good to have some parents on that committee. we will oh, yeah. no. good. all right good so right. as I, I understand that the parents are coming from the already existing yes Gibbs yes committee so that we're not we're not making a advisory committee yes. advisory oh you're not committee. great okay we're not, we're not actually going out again that got is it what I understand. okay that's right. what I want okay. to clarify thank you yeah. mm -hmm. yes mr. Hainer I have several questions and possibly a comment if I could ask you to look down through the different ones I'm going to address under the qualifications number two uh, Shouldn't it be specific to either middle school or secondary certification? So here's the thing about the licensure I mean the licensure I think if I look for principal um, in Massachusetts is either uh, K to six mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. five to eight Mm -hmm. So I know secondary. No, well there Either. there is for not not purely secondary. It's um, um, I think that there's really elementary, middle, and high school principals right. that and are licensed. So in I mean Massachusetts, and so I think we could conceivably hire someone with either a K to six license or a five to eight license. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, appropriate, and they'd be appropriately hired for this position. Uh, I mean, I, if someone had both, that would be great. I think I well. I think it's important to be specific on down to number uh, three it says at least five years of successful elementary and middle school teaching why would you have to have an elementary can, can I answer that yes <laughs> I, I, only because I was the one that kind of um, brought that forward as a, yep. con, um, a requirement um, this is a school that's going to focus on the transition between elementary school and middle school and so after much discussion with teachers and other administrators um, it was uh, felt that if a teacher had or a, a candidate sorry a candidate had both elementary and middle school experience they would understand the trend they would have better understanding of the transition so this is this is our preferred mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that that we would discount, discount out of hand someone who did not have this, but this is this is what our preference would I'm be. Just a little bit concerned. Preferred. We've spent a lot of money on people dealing with the emotional transition, our, uh, the issues of like that, where we're looking for an administrator, we're looking for a, I'm, I'm just responding, uh, an administrator and someone who's going to be doing evaluations. Yes, be concerned about the child as well, but because they, they, if they go, if they go for that middle school certification, that's part of the training in it. That's just my response to this. Mm -hmm. uh, previous administrative experience required at what level? So that again, that is could be elementary, could be middle, could be both. I mean, I think we would because this is unique. Because there are some districts in the state that still have elementary schools that include sixth grade mm -hmm. right there are some districts in the state that have middle schools that go from five to eight or four to eight even um, I you know there's a range of mm -hmm. administrators from different places that could potentially qualify. I guess all I'm saying is I'm not questioning any of that I think it just it should be a little bit more clear this that's all now down to number 10 mm -hmm. 
uh, other qualification acceptable to the superintendent. I mean, that is, no. to me, to me that, that, that leaves it, I can pick you, or I, I, I know I want you, and I don't want you, and you're going to have those qualifications because we're not telling the, the people up front. I think this is just very broad and open-ended. That okay. It may have been in the Audison, old Audison description. I mean, it's okay. not essential. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. And this is my opinion, my opinion only, but this, in my opinion, seems to be written with specifically someone in mind. I'm not making the accusation. That's my opinion. Mr. Slipman. Yeah, I mean, uh, other qualifications is acceptable to the superintendent. Uh, I, I just don't think it's an appropriate sentence to be in here. Um, because if, if, if we're, if we're going to be doing this the right way, we're going to be upfront about what our, uh, qual the qualifications we are. And if we have double secret qualifications, it just doesn't work. Uh, the, the other thing is, is that we really need to take the minimum qualifications and divide it out between, from the preferred to required. Because if you take a look at something that states minimum qualifications, um, you know, if you see uh, at least five years of successful elementary and middle school teaching experience with evidence of strong leadership ability, you're saying that you're requiring somebody to have middle school and elementary and if the statement at the table here tonight is we prefer to have somebody who's had both elementary and middle the statement at the table conflicts with the statement in the job description so that I, I would want to see the qualifications that, that uh, to reflect what what the must-haves and nice-to-haves otherwise we may have good candidates who will self-select out of the process uh, based on, well, they, they want this and I don't have it, so you know, forget about it, I'm going elsewhere. Uh, the other thing is, is to my mind, um, it, I guess I'll ask the question first, how are we doing on the Audison search? Um, so we've had some interviews. Um, I think we're probably gonna have some more interviews. Um, you know, we, we got some candidates that look promising, but we would like to go back in and see if we can uh, see if the, who else is uh, in the pool that we could bring in. Um, to, so we're in a couple weeks, I think, we're gonna have another uh, night of interviews. Mm -hmm. okay. See, my, my, uh, the reason why I ask that is, to my thinking, I wouldn't wanna go put out this job until we resolve the Odyssey job. Because I, I think one of the things that we need to work off of is work off of who the partner will be in mm -hmm. terms of dividing the school out. So uh, I'm, I am not ready to approve a job description and a posting until I see uh, the outcome of the Odyssey. Uh, I, I just want to know. So I have, I have a clarification mm -hmm. question. So. Are you saying the posting or because you could post something and then not look at the <laughs> results or, or not have made decisions about them? Uh, or do you mean the final approval of the Gibbs principle? Well, I, I'd say that I, I wouldn't want to put it out and start looking for people because you might take a look at the candidate we hire and might want to adjust what we're looking for based on the Audison person coming in. Uh, the, the thing is, is there, there's going to be a definite partnership both in terms of dividing the school next year and in terms of operating with the Audison principle in subsequent years. And it would be a twofer to have a, a Gibbs principle who complements the Audison principle. And if we know what we're getting in the Audison principle, we can craft the uh, the, the desired uh, qualifications to align to uh, to what we have in that position. So just for I, clarification I, on know. that, mm -hmm. uh, when we went down to Needham, the, the biggest negative that they had was when they hired two principals in their separate uh, middle schools separate when they hired them jointly with input from the from one to the other, mm -hmm. there was a compatibility that worked real well. They they emphasized that mm -hmm. to go along with that. Yeah. I don't remember that. And we don't we do not do the hiring. I want to make that clear. 
We approve the job description. The hiring is left to the superintendent. That's 100%. We don't have any input in that as, as a body. Dr. Allison Effie. So while I can see the points that Mr. Schlickman is making, that it would be nice to have one and then get the other, I'm concerned about the timeline and that we're going to be building a school and basically creating a school out of nothing. And I feel no matter whether we have an honest and principal or not, we need someone working on making this school out of nothing um, come June, July. Uh, and I'm thinking of how with the high school, we took two years to do the search. And you know it was good to go back and we got a really strong candidate. But that first year, we didn't find anyone that we wanted to bring forward. Right. And I can not having any knowledge of how the Audison search is going, I could see that that could happen. Um, so I disagree that we should hold on this. You know, I, I, I can see in the best of possible worlds, yes, we'd have these things in order and, and have lots of input and stuff, but I'm just not sure timing-wise and potentially candidate-wise we're going to be able to fulfill all those qu qualities. And I think it's more important to, ha to find a good principal and to have them in place and to have them help shape the school as it's being created. So I think, um, so I agree with Dr. Allison Ampey. I think that uh, there have been a lot of conversations about doing a search. Uh, the superintendent wants to begin a search. The superintendent, by law, doesn't have to do a search. He can make an appointment, um, and that's it. We're approving a job description. Um, you know, there's a, there's a the second paragraph of the job, job description just talks about timing, so it's really not part of the job description, actually. I mean, you know, when you're evaluated, you're not going to be evaluated on that second paragraph. You're going to be evaluated on, the, all the, on, the, uh, on what you're supposed to do. So I think right now, I think we should, my, my vote is to approve the job description and then let the superintendent do her job. Mr. Hanger. Uh, just one more point, and I, I, don't, I think it's to Mr. Uh, Spiegel. Uh, in the second paragraph up at the top, it said job goals. I'd ask you to look in the second paragraph, and right after spring of 2017, I would suggest eliminated be expected to. It sounds like a choice thing. Yeah, right. And at the very end, if the committee chooses to approve this tonight, I would suggest approval subject to the committee approving the stipend and sat final salary. Because that, I mean, and that should be done in executive session, not in the job description, but going forward. Okay. Um, I mean, can I respond to that? I mean, that was, um, that it will be posted, uh, and I can revise what would be posted in terms of the, the language. Um, it's not necessarily part of the job description going forward from July 8th, but it is the expectation of whoever we, when we would post it, that this is what we're looking for, someone who can jump in now but will really take I understand, but this is a new stipend. This is a new salary. It's because it's a brand new position. We own that piece of it. I, it would be very detrimental to have interviews with people. It, they may ask, "What is the stipend or what is the final salary?" It can't be done until we approve it. That's all. I'm, that's all I'm saying. Whether it belongs, it, it's Pete, something for us to consider, something for us to remember. And I don't want to tie the superintendent or whoever the hiring uh, people she may designate hand by having a salary still out there dangling. You, okay. you say to somebody, well, we, we're gonna offer you something in here, but the school committee has to approve it. Well, we have a, Mayor? Yes, please. We have a salary in the budget right now. Um, and if we are going to exceed that, yes, of course, we have to have a discussion about that. Did we approve that? Yeah, we just approved the budget. It's just for the well, budget. This, yeah. this is an issue that I brought up before. If you put salaries in, and it's just an overall salary budget, this is a new position, and we have the right, even though we may have approved a money, we have to approve the dispersing of that well, money in this position. Well, maybe I, we, have a, we have a salary in there for our Audison principal, and that gives sort of a range, an idea about what a middle school principal would have, because this is a middle school principal. So clearly when, when we get to that, pl that point, We'll certainly have a discussion, and perhaps we can we can uh, put that on a future uh, executive session. May I, uh, I want to talk to one point on the job description, and that is the last one that people are having some disagreement about. The superintendent can assign. Mm -hmm. This isn't a selection issue. This is once someone is in a position, 
It's, uh, we're not questioning a, the performance. Uh, we're we're, we're that questioning would be the, uh, the minimum qualifications. I wouldn't have any no, problem that being put into other a contract. Other qualifications as acceptable to the superintendent as a minimum qualification. It's just, it's awkward. Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, I, mean, right. I, think, I think when you say minimum, you should really mean minimum. And then, and then, you know, but, suggested but, or preferable. But, you know, just, but that line belongs. That one can go. But that line belongs in a contract, not in a job description. That's all I'm saying. So I think we're deleting ten. I, just so, ten, but we're not so deleting. Additional number. duties as requested by the superintendent well, is valid language, and it belongs in any job description. That's not a problem. Right, yeah. Okay. But, but, okay, Mr. Carton. So I'd like to move approval of the performance description with two changes. One is the deletion of qualification number ten. And the other is changing uh, qualification number three to elementary and or middle school teaching experience. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, great. So uh, that's the motion on the table. Any further discussion of the motion? Um, Dr. L. Sampy. Can I, this is for the administration, possibly Mr. Spiegel. Is it better to say elementary and or middle school or do you want to say five years of successful teaching, um, preferably with both elementary and middle school um, Yeah, but that experience. can be under minimum qualifications, and you got to have a separate. I mean, uh, one thing I could, I, mean, sometimes I could just say qualifications instead of minimum qualifications. That's mm -hmm. one thing, just and to then, say and then qualifications. Mm -hmm. And then within each one, we can say, pref you know, preferred or, um, and I, might defer to Dr. Chesson on that question <laughs> um, uh, that you had. If we change it to qualifications, um, I mean, it, we definitely want the person to have middle school, and mm -hmm. it w is preferred that they would have upper elementary. So, okay. in terms of, you know what I'm saying? So, but, but I'm happy to word it any way the committee is comfortable. I just want to make sure that the person has the visibility to both sides of the coin because. Mm -hmm. We really have talked about how it's so important to have this be a real yep. transitional school and to build a, a school that helps with the transition both in and out. And mm -hmm. that was that was my only intent. Yeah. So yep. I, have a, I have a question. There seems to be so many changes. If we delay this to the next meeting, mm -hmm. is that a problem in terms of our timing? No. What we would like is to have a person in place by late spring. We're going. We uh, some of the good news I'm going to give you tonight has to do with. Uh, AEF giving us a, a very a generous planning grant. And so we will be putting together committees. In fact, the, um, that we've already determined what the committees are. There's going to also be curriculum committees in, in thinking about what, what this transitional school is going to be like. And um, I would think that the person that we hire it would be great for that person to be part of summer programs. Now, we have sort of guidelines on stipends in terms of the work in the summer. So we're not, there's nothing that's going to be off the range here. It's going to be pretty much along the lines that we've, we, we do. Um, and actually, if it's a person in district, then there also may be the no need for much because it might be during a regular workday. So there's a lot of options here, but I, I don't disagree that I want you to be aware uh, of what the stipend would be and have you agree to it and what the salary will be when we get to that point. So waiting another two weeks would be all right, okay. and then we would post um, after that. Okay. So, so, so just a so, question. So that's, I think it might make sense to wait, but we also have a motion on the table that we need to vote on. I can withdraw well, the motion. You can withdraw. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that give you enough time? Which is, yeah, you just said it. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they yeah. think it's okay. It gives you enough it time. It just seems like there's enough changes that might be helpful to it. So, but, but does it yeah. give you enough time to have a full process with lots of participation? That's what I'm concerned about. Yes, we would post it and then there's yeah, a per I mean, period, period of number of weeks that we have to have the, uh, yeah. the posting out there and then we'll, we'll begin the, uh, yes, we'll yeah. begin the interview. Just for clarification, correct me if I'm wrong. The, the, you, your, your intent is to do an internal search, am I That's correct? correct? Okay, so that, as far as time, that you're not know, sending things out to newspapers and stuff. No, I think of Mr. Thielen was asking about um, sort of community wise. and teacher, you know, participation in the process. So if that's enough time, we can set up the whole the committee prior to. Okay, so agreeing so the motion that. has been withdrawn. So we're going to look at this again in a couple of weeks and hope you know be cleaner sure. and it'll okay. just make more sense to us hopefully. And if if anyone has um, further comments. Uh, after looking through this again, they should send them to Mr. Spiegel. Is that sure. right? Okay. Yes. Great. 
Okay, um, so uh, discussion of, on warrant articles, and this is what I did is I just sort of threw all the warrant articles on that have anything mm -hmm. to do. Um, we may have no discussion on some of them, or we may have a bigger discussion. Um, we are um, actually not quite as bad timing as I th we were before, but. <laughs> just to clarify yeah, procedure, are, are we just discussing, or is the discussion subject to a motion for support or what, or are you going to leave that open? Uh, I can, we can leave that open. I wasn't necessarily right. thinking that we would take motions, but if there is something appropriate and someone wants to do it, absolutely. The reason yes. I'm asking is in public participation, several people were asking us to support uh, uh, Sanctuary City. It's not mm -hmm. one of the one, is it? One? No, it's not necessarily, um, but, and, and then ask for a resolution. So maybe we can deal with that piece. Right. Um, I, I actually think this is something we should discuss next time we meet. Oh, sounds good. I think it's a full sounds agenda good. item. And it, um, it, it might give po policy a chance to And then to policy might be able something. to look at it. And sounds it just good. feels like this is something that we need right. to have a bigger discussion about. Yeah. Um, okay, so. So just, to, just so that, yeah, I, think, I think the, um, what we usually do with these is, if the school committee wants to take a vote on it, then, then the, we can take the vote. chairperson or another member of the, of the town meeting who's on the school committee, like yep. Paul or somebody, to get up and say, the school committee discussed this, mm -hmm. we voted. Mm. To support, to support. Okay. or yeah. not support. Otherwise, yep. you know, at ah. town meeting, you vote whatever you want. Right. Okay. That's, that's, that's all it is. And right. most of the time, we don't do much. Okay. Great. So. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Just, just to clarify, though, for most of these, we don't have the recommend, a recommended right. vote yet. Right. To right. We don't have exactly. So we can discuss and say, yeah, we're inclined to support right. that, but until we get the recommended vote, we then it probably and then, is not. And then it's right. So yeah. That's a good point. So we should probably, right. And if also, we were, forces you in a situation. I understand what you mean by a We don't have the exact the language agenda. of the yeah. warrant article because the when the selectman. We, we have the article, but we right. don't have what town meeting is going to vote was going to vote on the other vote on the so selectmen are you suggesting to wait to see see what the town meeting warrant specifically no, says so what, no. what we're saying is if we were to vote on something yes we would have to also schedule a meeting during town meeting because the language could, of the warrant article could change we usually have it usually have it in advance yeah. or, or, or okay. just that or, we will, yeah, we will I mean, have right. information in a few weeks that we don't have then, about, then, about the then, language of the i mean yeah. I don't see it changing dramatically on in any of the articles we have before us because it would be a substantive change and that would require opening the warrant no. again. Well, no, 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 we no. have for to accept placeholders. No, 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 they all change dramatically. Every single Excuse item me. changes. Article 19, yep. Article 15 are not going to change unless they open their warrant again. Substantively, no. the, 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 I cannot imagine either. Okay, one Mr. Schlickman, it's been intended. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, the, the, Article itself is the warning to the town what the possible vote is. Right. Uh, and as the moderator points out every year, the article is not the recommended vote. Uh, at some point, a recommended vote is going to be put forward. Now, I know that the selectmen have looked at uh, Article 15, and, and there's language that they're reviewing. I don't know if they've reviewed it or not. I don't have their appro right. approval. Vote. But it, if we want to say now that we are inclined to support it, then the homework would be to go and find out what the proposed right. recommended vote by right. the sponsoring body is, be it the select, uh, be it reported out by the selectmen or the finance committee or whichever body it is. Which will happen and then in a few weeks. confirm that we support the recommended vote of the selectmen right. or the recommended vote of the finance committee. So if we talk about something and say we have no interest in talking about it, uh, going forward, we ignore it. If we look at it and say, you know, we, we have, we want to take a position on that, then the next step would be to go and research what the proposed right. vote at town meeting right. would be, uh, inform the board who'd be making that uh, motion to the floor of town meeting, inquiring as to what their proposed vote will be, looking at it and seeing if we want to sign on to it. Okay. So that, that should be th the way we approach it. Okay, that sounds good. Excuse me. The selectmen did take a public vote on Articles 15 and 19. Then, we, but we right. don't have their we don't proposed have their language vote in front of us. It's exact. It's right. it, it was unanimous. All right. I think. I think what okay. makes sense is, is to go through these, have a brief discussion of each one, and then if we want to come back, mm -hmm. and take a vote on the recommended. Um, vote and I understand there's some that is up there I don't know if it's been reviewed by council I don't I don't, actually I don't I don't know the status of it I'll clarify right. this tomorrow so let's um, so article 15 uh, is the bylaw amendment to the Pride Commission and what I want to note is 
um, that this commission will have a school committee representative mm -hmm. on it. So if it's voted by town meeting, there would be a place uh, for the school committee to appoint uh, somebody. Yep. Um, and, uh, and if that were to happen, that would happen in the fall. So mm -hmm. just to make that note. Um, any comment on that, Mr. Slipman? Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the jobs we have here is to ensure that our, safe, our schools are safe and supportive for all our students. And I think the Pride Commission is taking on that task and as uh, a focal point of supporting our students takes place, you know, uh, sexual identity issues uh, are really come, come, to, come to the head while kids are of school age uh, in, in many cases and they need support. And to have, I, I, my thinking originally when I saw this is I hope that we have an appointment or two to the commission because of the importance of providing a safe yeah. environment for our kids. And that if there is a school committee appointment to this commission, I think we look at the language and support it because I think it's an important thing for us to be behind as well. Okay. And I have to say, um, we did discuss this in community relations because um, we got the heads up that, that there would be a suggestion to have a school committee appointment and community relations um, was in favor of it. Mm -hmm. so, um, okay, so uh, next one. So, sorry, just, oh, just, sorry. Just, yeah. so, I mean, a, a motion could be that, <clears throat> um, you know, the school committee supports uh, having a member of, of this body on that commission. Mm -hmm. So we could make that motion today. We can make that motion okay. today. It's in the record. Okay. Yeah, so I, I move that we support um, uh, having at least one member of the school committee appointed to the. Uh, uh, what, no, one no, no, member no. appointed by no, the, the school, school committee. Yeah, one, yeah, one yeah, member right, right. appointed by. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, one member appointed by the school committee to the uh, commission. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. To uh, the Pride Commission. Yep. Yeah. Any more? Any more discussion? All in favor? Okay. Uh, Dr. Asnampi says. Do we have to frame that as a request? Because we're not the ones organizing it. If I may? Um, they already asked us. They oh, asked they, us. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yes. I missed that. They asked okay. us. We, we, they asked so us. This and, is our and response. We're okay. some discussion in community okay. relations. And uh, it's now in the official language. But yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so motion on the table. What? Mm. Call what? it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It's unanimous. Uh, any more discussion on Article 15? Uh, okay, Article 19. Now, this is the town treasurer. This is a potentially um, interesting discussion that we'll have. Mr. Hainer. The article itself uh, is to vote to convert the office of town treasurer from an elected to an appointed position. I'm paraphrasing it. There's a little bit more. Um, at the discussion with the selectmen when they voted to approve this unanimously, they tried to separate this from the, what has come in the past of consolidated finance. Uh, I'm going to quote the chair of the selectmen, uh, Ms. Mahan, uh, from the League of Women Voters, the document that she went, there was, that was a question asked for not only select right. people, but for the three of us on, on the school committee. Her answer was, the town's financial management structure needs to be reorganized so that the various financial decisions making centers are accountable to the town manager through an appointed treasurer. Uh, the chair, uh, in her, her response, uh, our chair, uh, Dr. Seuss, uh, stated she'd like to see a consolidated structure using the language. I'm quoting from the DOR report January 2012, which was basically the following explains how the consolidated finance department works in Barnstable, the model used in the DOR report and recommended for Arlington. And this is what's going forward, and, I, and I'm surprised it was alluded to by uh, one of the people tonight, Mr. Rudiman, uh, of the consequences. Quote from that report, the school department has dedicated person, they're talking about Bonsable, the assistant finance director who focuses on solely on school finances, prepares the school budget, and oversees all school accounting. She is certified school business manager. No problem with that. And then, comma, but reports to the finance director. It's on page 20 in the fifth paragraph of that DOR report. My issue, as it was several years ago, is that if the CFO, or whatever we call it, does all that work and reports to the town manager, we no longer have control over that position and as such, we, may, we would be relinquishing our uh, fiduciary responsibilities. Can I finish please? Mm -hmm. The issue 
The issue here is it was before. We have to vote to relinquish that power. In order to have a consolidated finance de department, and it was clear in the DOR report, it will not happen if the school committee does not go forward with this. This is the, this is the majority of the selectmen have already indicated it in public meetings, and the majority, the whole, uh, I'm sorry, at least four of the members indicated they want a consolidated finance. The article itself only calls for an elected treasurer. The person who is running, Mr. Carmen, and the one who's going to be elected, he's the only one running, has indicated that he supports an elected position, is looking for uh, efficiency in this department, is looking to appoint uh, the deputy treasurer as the full-time, as the day-to-day -day worker. That position is appo uh, appointed by the selectmen, but supervised and responsible to the treasurer. I am nervous about this. This, to me, is a backdoor technique, in my opinion, of getting to what they want. Yes, we will have a final vote, but once the town does the appointment, makes this appointment, there is, there, I've said enough. Okay. I'll let it go. Mr. Sleepman. Um, I, th I think we're addressing two different issues. We have a legal responsibility for our own budget. It is our biggest policy document. Um, the uh, formulation of this budget, the monitoring of the budget, is our legal responsibility. We have before us here Kirsten's agenda and the vendor warrant, which we need to approve. Every check that's being sent out by the school department is approved through this warrant, and this is our legal responsibility. We have many legal responsibilities which cannot be taken away from us by law unless the state legislature makes a specific change to disinvest the power of budget fr from this committee. And I don't see any reason why we would go along with that, the town would go along with that. Um, it, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, we need a licensed, certified school business official to not only, who not only understands schools, but is reporting to us as we craft our budget and we monitor our budget. That said, there are functions that happen across the street in terms of paying bills, all our money comes from the town, it's spent through the town. What we don't want to have is, is waste and duplication of efforts of people keying in or doing approvals on one step and doing the same thing all over again once it goes across the street. I favor any efficiency we can squeeze out of this. I do not favor in any way uh, losing our authority or responsibility over the budget. Because if we have budget and policy and we give up budget, uh, we, you know, we, we have nothing before us. On the other hand, there are a lot of places that have appointed town treasurers or city treasurers uh, where you have very effective school committees, school departments, and, uh, and, and, and operations. I do not see the election or uh, appointment to the treasurer is in any way by itself uh, compromising our ability to function over here uh, on, on school expenditures. Uh, and as a policy matter, hiring a town treasurer, we have a more diverse applicant pool if we extend our request for candidates beyond the borders of the town of Arlington, and we have a more efficient hiring process rather than who can get the most votes in a town election. It is a professional position. Um, I don't see it as much of a policy position as some do. I think it's a managerial position. I think most of the work is, should, should be directly accountable to the town side that's responsible for the administration of the budget. We have software clashes between the town and, and, the, and the budget uh, and, and, and the treasurer's office. 
people, the efficiencies of incorporating the treasurer's office on the town side, I think are worth considering. And I, I, and I did write in my league statement that I support that first step. I don't think we need an, uh, an elected treasurer. I think that in a modern society uh, where we can go out and find qualified applicants, the best applicant will be one that we can uh, hire professionally uh, and for full time. So I favor the article if it is limited to exploring further for the purposes of putting on the ballot a question whether or not we should appoint the treasurer. I think that that's, that's a, a reasonable conversation. The, the question is, will potentially be put on a ballot? It's not, the decision's not going to be made by so, the meeting. So the question Let is, me, what, 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 what's the uh, proposed vote? Okay, I know a bunch of people, other people want to um, talk. Uh, Mr. Cardin first. Uh, thanks, yeah, the, the question before us is specifically about whether the treasurer is appointed or elected. I don't think it's a something for the school committee to weigh in on. It has the, the other plans that people are talking about obviously have effect on us, a consolidated finance department. But our interaction with the treasurer are quite limited. We have much more interaction with the controller than the treasurer. So I move that the school committee does not take a position on this article. You recommend that, I don't know if we want to vote on this, I vote on that. We, but but there's the a recommendation that we don't take a vote. Uh, yeah, I, probably makes sense, but Mr. Thielen. Yes, I don't know if we need a motion not to. Right. We just <laughs> if we don't, just don't. Do it, we don't <laughs> so I would say, so I agree with. Uh, Sorry, did someone second? Wait, okay. Um, no. no, we didn't second the motion. No. We're, we're, we're gently encouraging him to withdraw it. Okay. It wasn't a motion. Yeah. So, okay, let, yeah. so I was on the uh, Town Government Reorganization Committee several years ago with uh, John Billifer and Steve, and uh, it was it was and it was a very interesting group. Um, but the uh, way the, the way the thing was framed is that we couldn't talk about having a, an appointed treasurer. So that was sort of this restriction on this on this committee, and it was about how we consolidate uh, and communicate better between the school department and the town. I haven't reviewed those documents in several years. The DOR report that, that Bill's talking about, 2012. I mean, it's been a long time since yes. I've looked at that. So I think. It's, I don't think, I do recall though that uh, the school committee would have to take an affirmative vote to, yes. to uh, change the duties of the CFO in any way, shape, or form. So um, it doesn't really matter what the town meeting does. This body has to take a vote if yes. we want to change her duties. So I think I remember that accurately from that You're time. Mm -hmm. So um, I agree with Len. I think we don't need to do anything except be aware of it. I think yep. it's a good, and I think at town meeting, we've all been prepped for this and we can all opine. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's anything for the school committee to do tonight on Fine. this thing. So I, I don't, I just want to have one little thing, I know we've talked about this a lot, um, which is that the DR report, I mentioned this in my league, um, s strongly suggests that the town get consolidated before you even consider bringing in the schools. And so, you know, before we even have this discussion, I, there's a lot of work that needs to get done on the town side, I think. And we can't really look at what the real proposal is, I think, until several, you know, that has gone through. But the, if I may, the DOI report, the, the statement of consolidation means take the town finances and the school finances and consolidate them. But they Not, recommend do the town first the, before you even The major issue at that time, and I don't want to drag it up, is what had happened in 2010 uh, with, with the deficit that in the town had to deal with. That was the main purpose of doing it at that time. Then 2012 came and looked for the consolidation again, which they used the report. The, I agree with Jeff. We have to make a final vote at that time. We're not taking any action now. Okay, so we're not taking any action now. Okay. Let's move on. All right, so let's move on. So, um, uh, the, okay, so 27, uh, Legislation of Special Education Reserve Fund. Um, this was in a couple of places, right? This is one of the ones that was doubled in the special as well? No. There's two votes. There's two, okay. This one here is an acceptance of legislation around creating a special education um, reserve, fund. reserve fund. And it would operate, from my understanding, much like a revolving account. Mm -hmm that you could, like the year we, we deposited, we've done that actually twice. Money we put into the stabilization account, could it go into the reserve account? It doesn't require a vote of town meeting to go into it, nor does it a vote a town meeting to come out of it. Obviously it's um, transparent and everybody knows what's in it. Um, what's different is in the special town meeting, 
we have a stabilization account and there is um, money in that right. stabilization account that would require two-thirds um, majority of town meeting to move the money out and appropriate to FY17 school budget. And that's why it's in the um, special town meeting because m monies made available during the special town meeting are, are available right after that. Mm -hmm. So there's two things we're gonna, we're gonna, yep. we want this. Right, right. It's gonna give us a, a lot more uh, flexibility. It's certainly going to, in some ways, not change much other than it's a depository for a year. We have a good year. We have extra out of district monies that we could put in there. And then on the special town meeting, we, we want to vote for the full amount that's there. And as I understand, the Municipal Modernization Act that was passed last year at Beacon Hill was, was what allowed what allowed this. Allows this. Yes. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Allison Ampey. So um, these were inserted by the superintendent at the request of budget subcommittee mm -hmm. um, because we feel this would be a use, the, having the reserve account would be a useful fund. Um, my recollection is that although town meeting doesn't have to vote on it, I think the board of selectmen have to vote to at least to take mm -hmm. money out, and I don't remember about taking putting money in. Oh, okay. I had a question out to Doug Hyman, and I never got an answer uh, back about this. Um, uh, but I thought it had to be, there was, it, it's just, it's not town meeting, so it would be significantly <coughs> administratively easier than, right. than mm -hmm. what our current situation is. So we just felt that this would be a really useful tool um, mm -hmm. for handling our um, budgeting yeah. going forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Mr. Carden. Related to that, regardless of whether we actually need the full 325 in the stabilization fund, we should probably get all of the money out of the stabilization mm -hmm. fund. So put it in. Any yes. left over yep. into yes. the new fund. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so is there a feeling that we want to have motions supporting this, these, or do we want to just leave it? I think we put it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we put it in, so we, we support it. I mean, it's all in by the superintendent who <laughs> okay. is our right. appointee. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mr. Hainer. Uh, it, 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 as we go forward, I hope there is somebody from either the committee or the superintendent or finance person, whoever, can address this uh, when the motion is made and be prepared to answer any questions about it. Uh, yeah. going oh, forward. Uh, on the meeting, on At the, the night, meeting itself. Well, well, somebody the superintendent will be there to answer questions. Well, the, again, one of the things, and I mentioned the superintendent, these specific ones that are dealing with the school uh, outside in the regular town meeting, I, I think it would be beneficial to ask the moderator if we can address these all in one night. Mm. Because some of the people are, whoever our finance person is at that time, uh, Dr. Bodie, uh, Dr. Chesson, they're not town meeting members. And we, we, we afford this uh, privilege to take the uh, uh, regional school district out of order because of that person. I think we should afford our people the same thing. To, they're not big items, they usually get passed fairly quickly. There may be one or two people to ask questions, but to group them, to ask the chair, the moderator, to group them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should yes. definitely do that, yeah. Um, okay, so um, any more discussion of um, Warrant Article uh, 27? Okay, uh, Warrant Article 40. This is the appropriation of capital budget Gibbs School renovation. I think we're in favor of that one. <laughs> I hope so. No, I let's yeah. I okay. hope so. Yeah. Real quick question. Yes. This is definitely a placeholder right now because there's no monitor no right. dollar figure. Dr. Bodie, do you know if we'll have a dollar figure for the town meeting? Yes. Okay. And is there any reason this wasn't put in the special town meeting? It is. It is in the special town. So it's town doubled. Meeting. A couple of things are doubled. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's in both. Okay, it's in both. both. Yeah. It's in both. Thank a couple you. things are in both. I'm just dealing with the ones um, that we had. I, I think what's going to happen, because I was at finance committee last night, is that there'll be no action on this one. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. act on the special, special town great. meeting. Okay. Great. Makes sense. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Okay, and then we've already talked uh, about the transfer of funds. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so great. Um, when we have specific language on some of the other warrant articles, we might have want to have further discussion. Um, so Dr. Oh, special. Just well, yes. I was going to the regular. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I missed that. Yeah, what? I'm going to the regular. The the one that we were um, talked to about the sanctuary city is Article 59. Yep. But that is not. We list. don't. So what I think I think actually we should. 
have a longer discussion at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, because it sure. just feels like um, this is too too late to get into the kind of discussion I think that we want to get into. And the committee charge policy to look at yes. potential mm -hmm. language from other districts right. and stuff. Right. That's, that's and fine. I have some I'm, I'm just you. pointing out it's no, not no. on here. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not on here. You're right. Um, right. That's right. Um, okay, so then oh, I, I didn't realize that special was separated. Um, we're in Tucko 3, Appropriation of Capital Budget, the Hardy School Capacity Expansion. We're for we, it. We're for it. Um, <laughs> I mean. Do we have, do we know when um, that might commence? Do we have that idea yet or? or yeah. Not, yeah, that, the reason why it's in the special town meeting is that if we want the it to be completed in September 18. We really need to begin. That's what we're looking at. And that's what we did last year. We had to find the design money for Thompson uh, so that we can move forward. I, I think we should even have a, a earlier start date mm -hmm. than we've had, but um, doing this will allow us to start moving forward in that process. Great. Okay. Great. And I, it, I know it, it is in sure. the capital budget. Mm -hmm. Right. It's uh, $3.5 million. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And we think that's going to be sufficient. Yes, we had an estimate from um, HMFH, and then we had a peer review done by Shawmut, who, uh, who is the uh, construction firm that's doing the Gibbs. Mm -hmm. And through that process, we're, we're pretty confident of the numbers. Okay. Uh, in fact, last night, we, uh, the town manager and I presented um, this information to the finance committee, and which I will share all the packets with you. We just put them together y yesterday, and and uh, the the um, the memo going with each of them. But essentially, you know all this information anyway. We have had gone through this process to identify what the addition would be, mm -hmm. um, how, and then getting the cost estimates for it. The one thing that still remained, and those that were on the um, school Roma task force. We had a look at what would be um, an expansion of the cafeteria. And I think that the, the three options that were given to us um, were probably not going to go forward with, or maybe part of one of them, because I think there's more thought now maybe about using the room across the hall, which is currently a music room, mm -hmm. for an expansion of the cafeteria. And there's some question about what we'll do with the stage. But some money was also allocated for that purpose in this, it comes just shy of $3.5 million. But there's some very, as, in, as with Gibbs and Hardy, there is uh, substantial contingency money. So I think we're pretty confident of these numbers. Good, great. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so any more discussions of any of the warrant articles that are listed here? I know we're, we'll discuss Sanctuary Cities next. Okay, um, superintendent's report. All right. Well, changing topics completely, the mm -hmm. exciting news at the high school today. Hockey? Hockey. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, our hockey team um, in double overtime last night made it to the finals of the Super 8. Awesome. A, it was actually quite an accomplishment this year to get into the Super 8. And uh, I think that this, it's, someone told me today it's since 1971. 47 years. Wow. Okay. Since Arlington <laughs> High School has been in the Super 8. Right. So it's a fairly um, substantial accomplishment, but also to be in the finals. And I think in the newspaper this morning, they were saying that a public high school has not been in the finals since 2010. Wow. So the game is Sunday night at the Garden. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a late game at 745 in the evening because they do all of the other division championships, girls and boys ahead of that. Mm -hmm. So we wish, we congratulate them, the team, on how, how well they've done so far and wish them great success on uh, Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to say it's been a stellar year all around in athletics, um, but even the winter season, the, both the girls hockey did very well into postseason. The, uh, the, the boys basketball team did an outstanding job and our track team has been outstanding. Mm -hmm. So. Kudos to all of them. Um, last week, we uh, partnered with Vision 2020 to mm -hmm. host an evening called Reimagining Education. Mm -hmm. I think tonight you have some idea uh, of, you know, of the work that's going on in our schools uh, to really think about 
are the way that we teach and how we um, consider the effect of technology both as a tool but also as something that we, we need to be very conscious of because of the impact that students could have on you know, copying, reading, summaries, all of that in terms of how do we, how do we make it more of a, a tool for us than something that's, that's going to undermine what we're doing. And, and I want to congratulate Dr. Chesson because she did a fantastic job of getting this organized and maybe she could say a few words sure. about the evening. That'd be great. And thank you for all of you that came too. Yeah, it was an exciting night. Yes, it yes. was. And I, I want to um, specifically thank Vision 2020, um, Scott Lever and Julie Brazil and the Arlington Education Foundation um, for helping to sponsor this event. Um, while um, uh, the turnout wasn't um, huge, uh, people were very engaged in the conversation. Um, and the feedback I got from teachers is they felt um, very validated in the work that they were doing and they were really excited um, to be able to share what's going on in their classroom. And we had uh, 20 presentations, everything from the use of responsive classroom at the elementary school and the kindergarten tools of the mind program all the way up to using Hamilton to teach civics at mm -hmm. the high school. Um, and so I think people got to see the wide variety of things and when we talked about reimagining education we were trying to emphasize those things that um, and actually you talked about it earlier tonight that school looks very different mm -hmm. um, so it may not just be the involvement of technology but the use of authentic materials um, particularly the Spanish teacher at the middle school um, the type of material and the actually the Mandarin teacher also at the high school um, the kind of authentic materials they use and as uh, Dr. Ritz has told us before the amount of um, the target language that they use in the classroom I think uh, really surprised a lot of people mm -hmm. and um, we had both our computer science teachers both from the middle school and high school there mm -hmm. um, as well to talk about how we're trying to prepare students to participate in the community that's around Arlington that surrounds Arlington and we did a lot of that uh, with the support of the Arlington Education Foundation, but also with the input from community members about what kinds of skills our students would need to, in order to be able to compete in the 21st century. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Just like to make a comment. I commend Dr. Chesson to the superintendent and the committee. I have heard from multiple parents, multiple people that saw this, that uh, it was through her advocacy and hard work that made this possible. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. I'm only sad we weren't able to, to record it. There was some discussion um, recording. We ha yeah, it, the noise level and such was, um, but we did take some video of that, and then we're going to um, ask the people that presented. Um, we're going to go to those folks, and we're going to videotape their presentations, mm -hmm. and we'll start putting them out oh, okay. on the so website as soon as... Um, Actually, probably when the first round of um, MCAS Next Generation is done, <laughs> because the well, Susan Bisson, who cuts all our videos, um, is really tied up in MCAS sure. Next Generation right now. But she, we will start videotaping people, and then Good. she'll start cutting it and putting out there. Excellent. Good. Um, I want to publicly thank the Arlington Education Foundation for once again providing us with some very needed um, funds to support the planning for the Gibbs. And we we asked for a little bit less than what we, actually quite a bit less than we, what they finally gave us, and it's $30,000 for the planning. So that is really going to be very uh, helpful as we move forward. I think, I think everyone involved, and I've heard this from the people who were talking about this at AEF, are very excited about this. This is really quite uh, an endeavor we're taking on is starting a new school. And how is it different? How do we reimagine sixth grade education? Mm -hmm. Clearly, there's a lot that, that needs to be there because there are standards. But how do you teach the standards? Mm -hmm. And that's, that is the key. So I want to thank them for this grant. Um, I, I, the national, they are, they are, the uh, social studies team brought it up, but the National History Day uh, results this year in the regionals was outstanding. It's bigger than last year? Yes, wow. yes, and um, first in every category. So it was, it, it was amazing work that they did. 
And in some cases, some of them have been doing it from sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and have had, in a, a couple cases, have had success in eighth grade and had some very interesting projects. I think it would be great, and we were talking about these kind of um, uh, events, you get a real insight a little bit into the schools is to ha invite them mm -hmm. to come up some yeah. this spring yeah. and talk a little bit about some of their projects. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, Update on building projects. Okay. Quick, I'll just do some quick. Stratton is fine. We're moving along. Mm -hmm. We've been dealing with the rats as best as possible. As mm -hmm. soon as we can wow. close up those tunnels, I think that will take care of that problem. Uh, Thompson is off schedule at the moment, but the contractor says that we will be able to make up that time. There's been a delay in the steel. And so steel will not be erected probably for another two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. um, there is, they're doing some other work that would have been done after, and we have been told very reassured that the, uh, the different sequencing of it will have no effect whatsoever in, in the building. So that work is going on. Um, we are moving forward with the Gibbs project. We, we have a very large advisory committee uh, of teachers and parents who met and we talked about colors and there's more as we we need to move forward in getting some uh, feedback but so there's that aspect of it but in terms of the cost estimates and mm -hmm. getting ready to go out to bid all you know what well, we to go out to bid in terms of um, getting the next phase of this going all of that's moving very quickly and of course, once uh, town meet, we have the money from town meeting, we'll really be able to move, uh, move forward with this. Um, Hardy, we've already had some discussion about that this evening. So um, just quickly on searches, we've already talked about the search with o, um, OMS principal, we, but we are um, also engaged in a search for a CFO, and we had some interviews that it had to be postponed from this week, it's snow day, and it'll be moved to next week. And as far as progress on superintendent's goals, um, we'll talk more about that at the next meeting, but I think you saw tonight very clearly a lot of the work that's going on right now in goal 1-1 one, one. in terms of the learning goals in each, in each discipline. So you're, you're seeing it in a different kind of way of a presentation. But, but we, we have planned on the 30th to any, any of the goals that we have not talked about, to talk about them, where the progress is, and, and, and have you see where uh, the full panoply of mm -hmm. progress on all the goals are. And can we see a, we'll see a summary? Or yes, you'll we'll see a summary. Yeah, that'd be great, mm -hmm. okay. And that is all I have. Okay. Questions? Okay, great. Um, okay, so moving on to um, our next item, which is, um, discussion and communication between the public and the school committee. And I know this is something um, that's sort of coming out of left field, I think, for some people, but I know that Mr. Hainer would like to make a statement. I have a statement I'd like to make, um, and then we'll open it for a discussion. Thank you. Our society values the right of individuals to express their views and opinions, no matter how offensive they might be. The committee and the superintendent have received many emails from a resident of the town stating opinions, requesting information, and advocating for things that he felt the school committee and the superintendent needed to do or change. People have taken offense to some of the things he has said or the way he has said them. I respect his right to express his views, and I also respect the way recipients interpret what he had to say. Initially, the individual was told to come and speak during the public participation part of our regular meeting decided not to avail himself of that venue, but continued to write to members and the committee. At no time were any of these emails ever made public. He communicated an issue that he was advocating for to individuals who would benefit from what he was advocating for. My concern and my opinion, I want to make that clear, concern and opinion, is that public officials should not marginalize someone they disagree with. I have a deep concern when the public official tries to involve the people the individual had advocated for in marginalizing him. Lincoln's, Lincoln said it best, you can please some of the people all the time, you can please all the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. Thank you. 
Okay, so here's my statement. Um, so I, I respectfully disagree that I or anybody else have tried to marginalize someone. So um, I want to talk publicly about the type of communication between citizens and the school committee that I consider productive and the type that I consider unproductive. We are public figures. One of the things that happens to public figures is that we sometimes receive criticism from the community. Though such criticism can be unpleasant at times, it is part of our job as public figures to be under this degree of scrutiny. I do think it's deeply unfortunate that women in public office are criticized more frequently and those criticisms are li more likely to be personal in nature. Recently, a member of the public CC'd or sent me 25 lengthy emails in less than two months. The emails were sarcastic, accusatory, filled with ad hominem attacks against myself, the superintendent, and other school committee members, especially the female members of our committee. Because of personal connections I have in town and because of things that were sent to me by this individual um, as attachments, I happen to know that this has happened several times before, that uh, different town committees have received a barrage of emails to, um, that have had accusations and ad hominem attacks. So this has been a multiple, many year process. Um, that, that he's not well known in town is because he's only sending private emails. In my letter to this individual, I implored him to make his criticism public. I wrote, if you have a political point to make, I urge you to do so in a public forum, either in public comments at a school committee meeting or elsewhere, in letters to the editor, editorials, blog posts, mailings, or posts to the Arlington List. Uh, so here's the issue for me. Someone sends me 25 lengthy, sarcastic, insulting private emails, then that just makes my day less happily. If that person were to send, make those comments in public, then at least there could be discussion, both about the political points that he's making and about whether I'm guilty of what he's charging with me. So here's a small sample of, these are direct statements from him of the things that he's charged me with and the superintendent and other school committee members. That the superintendent and myself are either passive, closeted, or ardent racist that the school committee is impotent and that its members' interests are self-aggrandizement and not children, that we whine and cannot see beyond our noses excuses and childlike solutions to recognize and deal with basic underlying issues, that we are dominated by and carry water for the superintendent and are not serious independent adults, that our discussions are embarrassing, sophomoric, and offensive, that the school committee does not value teachers, this one really offended me, that the superintendent is deceitful and malicious and that she does not understand or recognize when there are problems in our schools. Um, I'm actually not mentioning some of the worst things that he said, which are about another member of our committee. Um, again, I implore this individual, I, I, any individual is welcome to send me a private email or anybody a private email. That's a right that some people have. But I, I don't feel that I have to answer such emails. Um, I urge uh, individuals who want to criticize us to do so in a public way. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. You can write a letter to the editor, the advocate, or other publication, speak at a public meeting, uh, write in the Arnton list. You can create a blog. You can hand out pamphlets. You can hold a sign. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of ways that you can be. And so I, I, I disagree that I'm trying to marginalize an individual when I've encouraged this individual and others to take their comments publicly and not to send me private emails. Um, but I don't think it's ex personally acceptable to me that in virtue of being a public figure, I should be, should be subjected to multiple private emails um, questioning my character. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm very angry about this. Um, I'm, I'm upset that this happened to me and to many other public figures in Arlington. Um, I'm a big believer that sunlight is a great disinfectant. I think that we open the windows and, you know, chase away the shadows on this. Um, and, um, and just let the town know that this has happened and that this has happened to other public figures in town. Okay, so opening for discussion. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. I, I'm a little shocked. I made my statement very vague for the, let me back off. You received, you mentioned you received 25 emails. I ask you to go back and research how many emails this committee got, both positive and some very negative and far worse in language when we started doing redistricting and when people didn't get what they want. We got tons of them and tons of them. Some people, I just do not feel as a public official that I should be using this venue to deal with any issues that I have with an individual. We have received, I have received, emails that I would not, I, I eliminate, because I wouldn't even have my wife read them. I was so offended. But being a public official, yeah, I feel I have to accept the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I don't think, as a public official, 
I have a right to deal with it in an open thing. One of the things, and, and I, would, I would agree with you, that some of those things might be perceived and, and, and an individual could take as hurtful. I would agree with that. But I also found that one of the emails was advocating for a group of people. I'm going to stop. Thank you. I, I just want to point out that this individual, this has multiple issues and has done this multiple times to different committees in town. Um, and so, it, and I'm objecting to the private nature of multiple lengthy emails, not to any political point that anybody might make, um, which I think people have a right to make public political points. Um, you know, I don't have any ability to prevent somebody from sending me an email, so I can't possibly marginalize a person by said, saying, oh, please make their comment in public, because someone can always send me an email. So, um, I will go back to you. Anyone else want to throw in something? No. Yeah, Ms. Dr. Allison Ampey. Aren't all of these emails essentially public? Because they're public, but they're I think the fact that the town doesn't know that this has been going on for a couple of years with multiple groups of people is because emails are also private a little bit. That they're, it's not a letter to the editor. It's not in the Arlington list. So, um, so we did. I didn't know about until I actually talked to personal people that had gone on to friends friends of mine in other bodies. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Hainer. I find this difficult to say, but one of the emails was a directed email to the staff suggesting that he wanted to work to increase their salaries. The way he suggested it, the things that he shared with them may be questionable. But there was a follow-up email. I have to stop. I'm sorry. I, 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 the reason I'm stopping is I think I'm, I, I might be entering in areas that do not belong in the public venue that deal with the Collective Bargaining Act, and, and I'm, that's why I'm stopping, and I apologize for that. I wish I could just back off my last statement. It might be good to leave it there. Okay. I really do. I, I, would I think agree. we're. Okay. I would agree. I would leave it there. I think okay. that's been said. I think Thank we should you. get the consent agenda done because it's yep. pretty complicated. Yeah. All right. Consent <laughs> agenda. Good move, Jeff. <laughs> All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. <clears throat> approval of warrant, approval warrant number 17138. Total warrant amount, $532,508.87, dated March 2nd, 2017. Approval of minutes, um, which, one's, which one is this? Oh, the, oh, these are the colon, I'm sorry. Approval of school committee special meeting, Thursday, February 16th, 2017. Approval of public hearing minutes on March 2nd, 2017. Approval of regular meeting minutes on March 2nd, 2017. Um, uh, so, a move approval. Move approval by Mr. <coughs> um, Thielman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Um, any discussion? There isn't. Sorry. We can't discuss, we can't discuss it. it. We're not discussing it. You're right. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. Um, <laughs> okay, sorry. I will get this someday. <laughs> in a month from now. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Okay. Um, okay, subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget. Dr. Allison Nancy. So, um, we passed the budget. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Um, this is actually kind of an announcement, because, but because it's budget, I'm going to bring it up now. So I was able to attend the session that MASC had on budgeting um, on March uh, 4th, and that was very interesting. I need to write up my notes and um, especially share the list of budgets that they consider exemplary for very re various reasons. Um, I think as we bring on a new CFO and as we look to the future, thinking about how we craft the budget and especially the use of more narrative in the budget document itself and graphs and, and um, infographics and things like that can help present our story of what's happening in the schools and what's happening with the town's money, the community's money. Um, and make it better communicated to, make it better understood to everyone. Um, and so that's something that I hope we can be doing over the next few months, so. 
uh, community relations. I know. Do you want to? Yes, budget. You want to? So on budget, are we going before the finance committee on Monday, oh. the twentieth? Mm -hmm. So okay. People often need oh, right. to yep. go. Yep. Yep. Um, what, we don't meeting? have community safety. Community safety. Community safety. What time? They Seven thirty. Seven. Okay. At what time? Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Right at the beginning. Yeah. They, you know. They, Dr. Bodie informed them that we don't currently have a CFO to come with us right. to the meeting, so it should be take questions in advance. Did you end up getting any questions? Not that I've seen. Okay. I'd suggest you. Yes, early this morning. I'd suggest you ask, remind him a couple more times. No, it's too late no, now. It's, yeah. Tony's oh. not available. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry Tony's about that. Not available to answer the questions. You're right. So. Um, so. Okay. 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 Uh, community relations. I know Ms. Starks is not. Do you want to? Right. Say I'm just going to just share with uh, about the chat uh, oh. that we had. It was. Uh, Let's do that. On, well, isn't that part of community relations? Oh yeah, I guess. It okay, is. under March seventh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, slow start. Nobody wanted to talk to me uh, until uh, about uh, 20 minutes into it. Got one parent asked about if we if we'd consider having uh, student government. As a school committee representative, said we already do. do. <laughs> she, said, she said she'll start uh, looking at it. Yeah. Uh, a parent and a son stopped and asked about immigrants and what we are doing. I told them about the policy we we're talking about. Third one asked uh, why the additions to Thompson and Hardy are not the and other schools. I responded currently now that's where we have our population uh, issues and we'll be looking at all schools eventually coming down the line. Asked about a buffer school child is how a buffer school child is placed. I told him uh, it is the superintendent's choice and quickly passed it on to the superintendent. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I stayed until 1230 because there, there were a couple, the last two were waiting in line almost. Oh, good. Uh, again, I find it uh, very, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tough because the owner wants to sell things. I bought one coffee and one muffin and I stood there for almost an hour and 45 minutes. And, uh, right, well, we, can have, we can have a discussion of, um, we could maybe switch the location. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, there was a big discussion about it. But, but it, um, they saw the sign, uh, only one person said they knew about it okay. ahead of time, the others but saw the sign. Took, mm -hmm. took, took an active part. I would support going forward with this. I think it's well mm -hmm. worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Slayton? Yeah, this sounds like the previous month in that uh, the owner was very concerned about us occupying a table for an hour and uh, uh, she needs to sell stuff. Yeah. So I, I ate and, you know, drank a couple of cups of coffee. Um, is it in the budget for us? Uh, <laughs> I'll eat more if there it is. Okay, so we're... Uh, and, and, and the folks also tended not to, you know, Kersey and I were sitting there talking to each other until about 10 to 12, and all of a sudden everybody showed up, and we were right. there until 12.30 as well. So okay. next month, anybody who wants to come talk to the school committee, you should probably show up at 11. Right. <laughs> so the, there's a new uh, cafe opening up uh, in Broadway Plaza. Yeah, in Cafe Nero. Uh, cafe Nero. Yeah. Uh, and uh, perhaps when they open, we might we can talk about uh, that. try them too, mm -hmm. uh, so we're not clogging up. Yeah, uh, yeah. Kickstand. Great. Uh, so I just encourage you to get your notes in. I send them to Cindy. I apologize. I'll send okay. them to Karen. And, and I know uh, we're still waiting on one other notes in the past, right? Are we still? Jeff and I got ours in. We're covered. Okay. Ours? Yeah. You, you did I get yours in? in. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. I didn't see it. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So, and I um, can say that we met, I think we haven't had school committee meetings since we met. We met to discuss the um, Vision 2020. Um, a thing that Dr. Chesson was just talking about um, with the presentation of 20 teachers and talk about some logistics. Um, we also talked about, oh no, we did talk about this already. Yeah, never mind. This is something that was reported out. I couldn't remember if our timing was reported out. Okay. Um, district accountability curriculum instruction and assessment. No report. Okay. Facilities, no Mr. Report. Thielman. Policy and procedures, Mr. Hainer. Uh, our meeting was canceled because of snow. Uh, <coughs> we will now schedule another one, and uh, we'll have all the work done assigned to us. Real quick, uh, I'm going to mention again uh, to the audience, uh, it was brought up tonight about looking at uh, uh, issues for us to support the sanctuary city mm -hmm. that will be coming on our agenda. Mm -hmm. Right, policy. great. Uh, Just to clarify, it's, yeah. it's not this, I mean, it's sort of a statement by the school department on I understand. Exactly. They're, they're not a policy, things, yeah. but it was directed but, yeah. to policy. There's actually, yeah, there actually are two things. One is a 
potential commentary on what's going on um, in town meeting right. warrant. And another one is an independent statement, mm -hmm. yeah. potentially by the, like Summer, but, Somerville but I, did. Just to share with yeah. you, some of the documents that I've already received are actual school committee policies that have done. That's something for us to discuss. Mm -hmm. Right, we want to discuss. Okay, right. okay. Uh, school enrollment task force. No, yeah, is that what we're up Nothing to? Nothing right now. No okay. Uh, legal services Nothing review. This time. Okay, Arlington High School Building Committee. So this, the building committee meets the first Tuesday, Tuesday of every okay. month at 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. We have uh, formed, well, there's gonna be three subcommittees to start. There's gonna be a communication subcommittee, which Kiersey is on, mm -hmm. um, and an OPM subcommittee. And the OPM subcommittee has met, and your subcommittee has met. I'm, I'm on, our, our committee has not met yet. Okay. So, so we, you know, it's moving along nicely. Um, it's good uh, dialogue at the last meeting, and um, you know, we're moving forward. And there should be, you know, we'll have monthly meetings unless there's no reason to meet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now Jeff is chair. Right? Oh, yes, Jeff is chairing the meeting. It was yeah. attrition. Yeah. It was no one. Else <laughs> it was, uh, that's how it works. So, um, don't underestimate the manpower shortage. So I think at some point it's probably too early in the process that. Um, Public will want to have opportunities to make statements. Do you have that at the beginning? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Gibbs Committee. Uh, so it's, we heard a little bit about it, and, and Starks is not here. Um, Work Committee. Everyone get paid. Okay. Uh, liaison reports. Yes, Mr. Hainer. As uh, school committee representative to Audison, I attended a meeting last night at Audison. It was a parent forum. And uh, the title was Eight Things You Cannot Do for Your Children, but Wish You Could. It was a full house. My intent was to stay for about a half an hour to see what it was like. He, the speaker was riveting. Mm -hmm. It was fabulous. Uh, I, I wish he could have come and spoke to all my parents when I was a teacher. It would have made life a lot better. And he, he brought a lot of humor to some very serious topics, and uh, it was excellent. It was just really That's excellent. Michael Lerner, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. And if I would, uh, Permanent Town Building Committee will meet next Tuesday. Dr. Bodie covered all the things from the last one already. She steals my thunder each week, but that's fine. Any other liaison reports? Um, Dr. Allison Happy? So uh, Mr. Hainer and I went to the EGCO meeting um, and they had Tracy Novick talking about committees doing self-evaluations mm -hmm. and um, basically it's, it's looking, it, it's different ways of looking what you've done over the past year and deciding if you like it or you know, to shape how you're going to go in the future. Um, I personally thought it seemed like a good thing for us to undertake and this might be a good year to do it because we're keeping the same committee f going from this year to next year right. um, and that perhaps in early April we could talk about doing this and I don't know maybe Mr. Hainer would be willing to work with me to basically the easiest way would to be to come up with sort of an evalu evaluation topic I mean evaluation document that asks questions have everyone fill it out make a compilation then have a meeting to discuss um and is there a sample of that of yeah that, that's we have to, the, they've had a couple samples uh -huh. but i think we'd want to do something something unique to, something mm -hmm. unique to ourselves um and you know i'm thinking it's more important to actually get something done and do it than have it have that document be perfect so i right. think like Mr. Hainer and I working together to come up with something and then just doing it. We can figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. We might want to consider having a moderator conduct the meeting where we discuss the results. Mm -hmm. um, that can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. so. Actually, can I ask a question about liaison? So the, you're the liaison to the AEF. Have all those grants been made for the year? Or is there? They, um, they have a rotate, a oh, ongoing process. Okay, so, I thought there was you know, no, 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 no. You're thinking of some of the other um, councils that okay. have like one time. No, they have a multiple year. The most recent one was the um, grant that Dr. Bodie talked right. about. Okay. I don't usually talk about the AEF grants because you can only talk about them after they've been released. And I'm not right. always aware of when they've, you know, I know what they are, but I don't know when they've been officially released. Right. So right. I don't want to speak out of turn. Okay, great. Um, the li other liaison reports. Um, I just wanted to say I went to Arlington Beats for Eats and they raised more money than they had last year, which was already huge amounts of money, enormously successful. Um, Mr. Schlickman was there, yes. <laughs> um, and it was, it was great, it was a great time, yes. 
Just want to mention the Metco day on the hill got canceled as well as right. for the snow right. again. That will be. I will report back to you and let you know the next day. Uh, announcements. Real quick, yeah. um, the the Metco uh, group, uh, Dr. Bodie and a group of us went in, in bridging two communities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been successful getting one bank and possibly another bank to financially support us okay. with a one-time contribution, fairly substantial. Uh, once I want them to, I'm sharing this with you right now, but I, I give them an opportunity to how they want it to actually be presented. Uh, it, it, a contribution it, for what? For to basically support uh, the a gathering. The, well, the groups that are getting together initially to to set an agenda and stuff uh, for for food and snacks mm -hmm. and possibly to augment uh, transportation. The next meeting will be coming up on the 22nd in Boston. So to take the Arlington people into Boston if they don't, mm -hmm. I think right now it, it, carpooling is going to be so it'll cover. The last time we had a meal and it was quite substantial and uh, to. Uh, our uh, medical director, uh, Ms. Thomas, mm -hmm. a big chunk of it came from her. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find some finances so that that won't be a burden on her or the committee or mm -hmm. the school as well. So I, hopefully the next meeting I will be giving you more specifics. Mm -hmm. um, I want to mention that the AEF is doing their trivia bee on Sunday the 26th at 3 o'clock. I know the school committee has a team. Um, I think they're still looking for a couple more teams, so if you have a neighborhood group or a group of friends or a poker club or a book group, please um, send <laughs> the names along. I think I think there are two or three seems shy of where they want to be. Um, Dr. Brody, are you going to be there? I am. Again, doing as one of the judges? Okay, great. Okay. So you're going to be judging us then? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun. Um, any other announcements? Okay. Uh, future agenda items. Karen uh, put out an email saying you want the committees approved by next week for the budget book. Is that what you want? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So is that? I mean, can we do that before? Wait. We're... Who's on the committee? No. Oh, no, no. Who's no, the no. chair and stuff? Yeah. Oh well, we're not. We're, I'm not sure. There's an election happening, but yeah, so we know sure what the we... election's going to look like. Yeah, I'm not sure. We. <laughs> so I, I was going to raise the issue because I'm. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure we can do that yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah if we want to get a head start on it we could schedule an, a special organizational meeting early in April so that rather than waiting for the second Thursday in April we can reorganize quickly on, say on April, April 2nd, 1st 3rd or third or fourth or something. Sunday would be. No, it doesn't help for what she yeah. needs. To well, do. We, so. we 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 just don't have a, a committee until after we reorganize. So you send it. So the problem is you send it to the printer. It's on Friday the thirty-first. <laughs> I mean. Okay. Well, we'll, well, we'll just see just what we can finesse it. I mean, it's not like anybody's going to get kicked off the committee. Mm -hmm. That's right. One I mean, thing. this is yeah, an easier year. And I don't think there's any so statute. I'll stay in the same committees. For no, no, I mean, but no. we, um, actually, Karen, I was going to let you pick them. School <laughs> the school committee is not competitive race this year, so we're not. So all right, all right, why don't yeah. we, we'll figure it out offline. Yeah. It's not okay. competitive I'll, I'll race. I'll talk to you I don't think it takes some, uh, I'll, I'll figure it out, I'll, I'll figure it out with you. Okay. Okay. I know, I know the deadline and I just needed to understand that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Executive session. Um, and are we coming out of the executive session? I don't think we need to, okay. Uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Negotiations update. Vote to approve the following executive session min minutes, March 2nd, 2017. Um, Vote one by one. Motion first. Mo motion first. Yeah. Okay. Motion to enter executive session as stated. Thank second. you, Mr. Hayner. Uh, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampe. Um, yes. Are you? Yes. 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 